All right, for the City TV folks, we are going to get started here. <clears throat> All right, everybody, good evening and welcome to the Thursday, November 9th regular meeting of the Santa Monica Rent Control Board. Um, will we please uh, call the roll? Yes, Commissioner Gwynn. Here. Commissioner Ivanov. Here. Commissioner Gonska. Here. Vice Chair Leslie. Here. Chair Foster. Here. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Uh, if you'll all please join us for the salute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, if the other board members will take a moment, or if you've already done it, to um, take a look at the minutes from our last meeting on October 12th, and I'll take a motion to approve those minutes. Oh, oh, you do need to give that, don't you? Okay. I move to uh, approve the minutes. Thank you. Second that motion. All right. All those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? That passes. All right. Um, we're going to go back to item four and have a report of our prior closed sessions from our executive director. Yes. Thank you. The board met on October 13th and on October 14th for the purpose of interviewing candidates for the position of executive director, and there was no reportable action. Thank you for that. All right, uh, and number six, we'll hear from Tracy again uh, for our special agenda items and announcements. Okay, thank you. So I want to mention a few things. Um, at the end of this month, or the very beginning of December, people should be looking for the rent control news. Uh, our fall newsletter will be delivered at that time. And it goes to all property owners and tenants in Santa Monica, as well as property management companies. Um, I also want to mention that we will be doing two seminars in the month of December. We will be doing a tenant seminar in Spanish on Wednesday, December 6th from 6.30 to 8.30 at Virginia Avenue Park. Um, and the seminar is comparable to the seminar that we usually do in the spring in English um, for all tenants and covers a lot of things about what kind of services are available from the rent control agency, what the law provides. Um, so it's a great introduction to the law for anybody that's interested. And you said that's December 6th? That's Wednesday, December 6th from 6.30 till 8 p.m. at Virginia Avenue Park, the Thelma Terry Building. And then we will also be doing with the uh, Consumer Protection Division of the City Attorney's Office a joint seminar that we do in uh, December, and that will be on Tuesday, December 12th from 9.30 to 11. Both of these seminars will be in person. Um, this one will also be at Virginia Avenue Park. And this is always well attended. People are very interested in among the things that will be covered this year in terms of hot topics are um, the source of income discrimination, law changes that have occurred recently, rules for repayment of outstanding COVID-19 rental debt, um, ADU regulations within the city and tenant rights, and um, updates on our civics portal, which is our publicly accessible portal for people to submit forms and things um, into our office. So, and then there's always an active Q&A session where people ask questions and our pr staff um, advises them or pr provides answers. So, it is important to register in advance for either of these. Uh, in the newsletter, we will have a QR code that people will be able to use. They can also access our website for the information about how to uh, sign up for either of these seminars. That's what I have. All right. Thank you. No questions for, oh, uh, Commissioner, Vice Chair Leslie has a question for you. So do you have a uh, seminar in Amharic? Or do you have something for translation into Amharic? We have not done a 
seminar in Amharic. Um, we can look into whether we could potentially do some sort of uh, translation when we're doing either the English or Spanish. Um, Mr. Costello can look into that, but no, we have not done that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, and maybe a translation can be um, as requested. You know, with like prior notice, maybe it can be on the basis of rather than um, always having it in yeah. endless number of languages, it's as you know as needed or as requested, maybe. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that we are more inclusive, so that members of our community are not excluded or to feel like it's not for them because it's not in their native tongue. Yes, thank you. All right, on to item seven. This is our time set aside for public comments. This is for items that are not on the agenda but that are within the purview of the rent board. Uh, but we have no request to speak tonight. So it's last chance, last chance for public comment. All right. Uh, moving on to item 10, our jurisdictional items for the evening. Um, we have an exemption case, 10A1, 2523 3rd Street, applicant M. Baum, owner. Can we have a brief staff report? Good evening, commissioners. Um, Mr. Baum bought this property at 2523 3rd Street uh, in September of 2022 and said that he moved into it in November of that year. Um, the property has only, um, the property, um, Mr. Baum is the sole owner of the property, and the property only contains two units. So both of those aspects of the requirement for an exemption are met. The question that he had to prove to the board is whether he's lived on the property as his principal residence since at least April 26, 2023. Um, Mr. Baum doesn't own any other property in Los Angeles County. He does have a property in Texas where his mother lives. Um, he also supplied utility, financial, and government records to show that he's lived on the property for the requisite amount of time. And the hearing investigator who visited the property, her report is also consistent with his claimed occupancy. Staff therefore recommends that the board grant the exemption and adopt the proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. Thank you. Um, we do actually have a speaker on this item. Um, Mr. Michael Baum. Okay. Should you come forward? Sir, yeah, why, yeah, why don't you just go, at, go ahead and come. Just can't hear you in the record. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Baum, I have them here if you'd like me to point them out to the... I have them. I have them too. Mr. Baum, if it's okay, we'll have staff uh, read to us what page numbers and things to turn to, if that's all right with you. Okay, that's fine. So uh, it's the staff report and exemption application on the basis of owner occupancy, three units or less. In the summary, uh, on the third street. No problem. Thank you for noticing that, and that is not a problem tonight. And then on the second page, it's on paragraph number three, it says frontier bills, which are addressed to Mr. McLean. That should be Mr. Baum. Okay. Those are rare mistakes, but thank you for noticing, and there's nothing wrong with correcting the record, so we appreciate that. And thank you for being here. For any questions, you can have a seat for the moment. Uh, any request to speak on this item by the other commissioners? Seeing none, this looks very straightforward. Um, there are no um, irregularities, nothing sticking out at all. So um, I would accept a motion to move this item. I move that we grant the application and adopt the findings of facts and conclusions of law. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. If you could call the roll, please. Yes, Commissioner Gwynn. Yes. Commissioner Ivanov. Yes. Commissioner Gonskin. Yes. Vice Chair Leslie. Yes. Chair Foster. Yes. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, folks, for coming tonight. Uh, all right. You're welcome. Item 10B, we have uh, three appeals tonight. Sorry, you should have announced that. Oh, wh which one, Tracy? Uh, 10B2, decrease. 31631 has been continued. 
continued. All right, so item 10B2, a decreased petition uh, with the owner appealing, uh, has been continued to a future date. All right, thank you. So that leaves us with two appeals. Uh, 10B1 is 1937 17th Street, Unit C. The appellant is Mr. M. Eck, tenant. Can we please have a staff report? Commissioner, is under the rent control law, if a landlord believes that a tenant is using the control unit as their secondary residence, they can petition the board to find the tenant not in occupancy um, under board regulation 3304. And if the evidence shows that the unit is no longer at the tenant's residence of usual return, then the hearing officer will increase the MAR based on recent comparable rents in accordance with the regulation. And here the landlord alleged that Mr. Mustafa Ek, who has lived in his unit since 2010, no longer uses it as his residence. A tenant not an occupancy petition, the tenant bears the burden of proving that they continue to occupy their unit as a residence of usual return after the landlord has provided prima facie evidence of the um, of his, in his petition. The hearing officer here found that the tenant failed to meet his evidentiary burden and increase the MAR in accordance with the regulation and the tenant has appealed that decision. The board reviews this matter as an appellate body and therefore if substantial evidence supports the hearing officer's finding and the decision is reasonably supported by the record, the board should affirm the decision. Mr. Eck testifies that he travels frequently for work. He's married and his wife lives about seven minutes away. And Mr. Conf uh, Eck confirmed that he also stays in his wife's apartment but claimed that his own apartment was his residence of usual return, and he submitted documents to show that he receives mail and correspondence there. The hearing investigators report also saw that he has clothing in, the, clothing in his apartment and personal property and personal possessions. The landlord testified that he'd reviewed the security camera fo footage for six months uh, prior to the hearing, and he never saw Mr. Eck until the end of each month and only saw him stay for a few hours. And when the landlord asked Mr. Eck if he could provide any, specify any three days in which he, he was in his own apartment so he could verify through the security footage, Mr. Eck declined to do so without further explanation. When asked about how many nights um, Mr. Eck spent in his apartment in the months before the hearing, when he wasn't traveling and when he was in town, Mr. Eck responded, quote, at least a few, I'm not sure, and quote, several days, several nights. When asked if he could describe his routine when he's in his apartment, he responded that he didn't have a set routine. Quote, I t aim to spend a decent amount of time in my apartment to take care of my stuff, my plants, my laundry, just making sure everything is up to speed. Mr. Eck testified that he splits his time between his wife's unit and his own 50-50, but that in this year he spends a little more than 50% of his time at his wife's. The hearing officer found Mr. Eck's answers as to how much time he spends in his own apartment and where he carries on basic living activities as vague. While she understood that a witness may not be able to recall the routine from several years ago, she reasoned that an individual can typically provide greater detail from a more recent period than Mr. Eck had. She also found his testimony about his routine when visiting his apartment as more akin to checking in on things and, quote, making sure everything is up to speed and not as carrying out basic living activities. She therefore found that the majority, he carries on the majority of his li basic living activities at his wife's apartment when he's in town. She gave less weight to the evidence regarding his mailing address and location of personal possessions because he's only a few minutes away when he's at his wife's and he can come over to pick up his mail and check in on things and access personal belongings and clothing as needed. And, give, and weighing the evidence is, of course, the province of the finder of fact or the hearing officer. Given that record, she concluded that he failed to meet his evidentiary burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence that he continued to occupy his apartment as his residence of usual return. Her findings are supported by substantial evidence in the record and is reasonably supported by the record. In accordance with the regulation, the hearing officer then increased the MAR based on recent market rents for comparable units on the property. The regulation specifically defines what comparable units is as being the same number of bedrooms. And unit D on this property meet the criteria of having been recently rented and having the same number of bedrooms. So the MAR for the unit is 2,600. 
But the regulation then directs the hearing officer to adjust that new MAR if there's a showing of substantial differences in the amenities between the apartments. The tenant has submitted new evidence with his appeal that he never submitted into the record at the hearing when he could have done so. Uh, the board should not consider the new evidence. The only evidence submitted into the record by either party at the hearing was a landlord's testimony that he had upgraded Unit D with new floors, countertops, and cabinets, and reglazed the bathroom, and the tenant's testimony that his unit had no upgrades. Taking into consideration the new MAR of 2600, the hearing officer then considered the proportion of these upgraded amenities and consist uh, to the total package of amenities paid for by the rent and consistent with the amounts in recent decisions in similar cases for these types of upgrades, the hearing officer downwardly adjusted the new MAR for Mr. X unit by $150 for the upgrades. Because substantial evidence supports the hearing officer's finding and the decision is reasonably supported by the record, staff recommends that the board affirm the decision and its findings of fact and conclusions of law. Thank you. Um, before we go to public comment, uh, I think we have a couple of questions for staff. Did you want to go first? Sure. Commissioner Gonska. Thank you. Uh, can you provide some more information about uh, um, prima facie, what, what would uh, constitute meeting that standard? Uh, reading the staff report, one of the uh, things that stood out to me was that there didn't seem to be any verification of the video that the built that the uh, property owner or the building manager uh, said that he reviewed uh, and I was curious if that just simply stating what that per person says they saw is enough or if there was something else in the record that met that standard so I can answer that question for you Commissioner Gonska so uh, as a preliminary matter when a landlord wants to file one of these petitions the documents that they want that they believe support their position are filed with the petition and so in this case um, those documents were filed with the petition um, along with um, whatever video there were also other documents um, such as uh, a property search identifying who the resident was um, uh, I believe a you know car who's parked in the in the back parking lot so what constitutes a prima facie case for purposes of these types of petitions, um, prima facie in this case means um, minimum amount of evidence that is sufficient to support a finding uh, if, those, if that evidence is unrefuted. Once that, that's a minimal standard. And those, uh, that standard is reviewed by the hearing uh, manager to determine whether that threshold has been met. If that threshold is met, it then goes to a hearing, and then the burden shifts to the tenant uh, to produce sufficient evidence to prove that this is their usual residence of return. So is it, is it under the board's purview to review that aspect of, of this case within the appeal? to see if that standard was met or not? So all of that would fall under the substantial evidence standard. Um, so if there's any, if there's that minimal evidence that supports that finding, then that would require that that would, that is upheld. Okay, and the original petition I don't believe is included in the information, that it, or is it included in the information we have? It's not. Okay, because there are, um, in reading the regulations, uh, there are several things that must be included in the petition in order for that petition to be valid. Obviously, we're talking about the prima facie here, uh, standard here, but there are other things like that they must uh, state what address they think that the tenant is actually living at primarily and some other things that are required as well. However, we don't have access to that information in the packet that we received, so I'm not sure how we're able to determine if that was properly done here. I think if there's some question about whether that information is not, I mean, this is a this is a checklist. I mean, um, I think he's referring to the staff report and how thoroughly certain aspects are explained or not thoroughly explained. So you're asking in the staff report, you want it to be confirmed that those 
that that could be one way to go about it. But I think if our role here is to make sure that that all aspects of the hearing and the entire process that there weren't any errors here, not to substitute our opinion or our judgment for the hearing officers, but to ensure that the procedure, the regulations are properly followed, that we need to be able to see that. And so whether that's a thorough explanation in the staff report or inclusion of the original petition with the staff report, something that we can actually verify that. Sure. I just And I want to remind all the commissioners that you all have access to every aspect of the record. Just because it's not included in the packet doesn't mean you can't have it. So if in your review you want to see the petition to verify that all that's there, please let us know and we'll happily make that available to you. Okay. And it was that petition reviewed uh, by staff other than the hearing officer in this case? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Ivanov has a question. Yeah, so <clears throat> do I understand correctly that if the, because you're asking about the original petition that the landlord filed, right? Correct, yeah. If that petition did not meet the minimum qualifications with the supporting documentation, it would not have even been accepted, right? I mean, we would not have even gotten to the point of having a hearing. It would have been thrown out and rejected, and he would have had to refile to meet the requirements, right? That's correct. Okay. I think it, it would, it, it should be, according to the, to the <clears throat> regulations. We just, I'm just questioning if you want to verify that that was done in this case, how do we go about doing that? I think this, so Mr. Gonska about this case and about these issues and we've talked with staff at length about um, our questions that we're, use, that we're having tonight. And so some of it goes to um, the board's familiarity with every potential possibility at every step of every hearing process and and familiarity or lack of familiarity with typical and customary standards. And I think when we come across something in less than seven days before, you know, we're, we're dealing with it, that isn't um, obvious or that is thin seeming or from the outside, you know, looking back in, I think that's just what we're, we're talking about. So, um, in a lot of other TNIOs that I have witnessed in over seven years, I've seen much more um, obvious evidence. And when you see, when you hear something that seems maybe thinner Pervade. on its face, you just wonder, well, what is that? You know, what is that process, and is it being is it being performed correctly? Because that's really our only function as an uh, an appellate body is to check the process. And just to elaborate on that point, I, I have the utmost respect and confidence in the staff uh, that they're doing all of this properly. It's not an accusation. It's merely, as you stated, that there are a number of things within the the record here that uh, present additional questions in my mind, concerns in my mind. And so uh, perhaps even more so than the typical appeal that comes before us, I'm interested in, in checking every single element of this one. Uh, to understand how this determination was made and that it was made properly, which is our role here, to make sure that there weren't any errors from the hearing officer. Um, and so just like uh, our chair said, just trying to under find out where can we retrieve this information and in the fact that I don't have it in front of me, I could have obtained it, don't have it in front of me, just asking staff if they did it, just to confirm that. Um, and I think just one piece of of uh, the record here that initially caught my attention was the how it seems according to this report how this you want to save that for discussion or is this still a question uh, for staff because we, we have to let yeah it's still I still want to understand okay. the, on the sorry to interrupt that's okay on the uh, prima facie al uh, standard understanding exactly what here in the record, not just as a concept or a theory, but in the record here, in this case, what can we point to that determines that that standard was met? Um, and that's why I had the question about if the video was reviewed or not. I, I also just want to, I'm going to allow Hawke to answer the question. He's more familiar with the petition, but we have a copy of the petition here. <laughs> if you all want to take a look at it while he's speaking, we can pass it around. Um, if I could just refer to it first, so that I'll pass it along. So, uh, as as um, Ms. Regan um, pointed out, that the standard is um, a low standard, and so it doesn't meet the elements. And, and in this case, the 
landlord referred to the fact that he, would, he checked the security footage and he didn't see her. So that was one allegation that he brought forward. And he also said who he did see to somebody else who is the, um, who happens to turn out to be the tenant's mother who's staying in the property. Um, he took photos of who's parking in the car and the person uh, and the car that was seen was the mother's car, not the son's car, M M Mr. Eck. Um, he took a photo in the uh, an apartment where, which is owned by, I'm sorry, which is rented by his wife, where his wife lives, and he, the and has a photo of the car um, that Mr. Eck presumably may be driving parked there. Um, he also said that the registration of the cars that he, is parked in the own prop in uh, the property at issue is registered in Arizona, and um, he also. It is his opinion that the, um, Mr. Eck is actually, his primary residence is where his wife is staying. So these are all the things that were included in um, the record. You know, the photographs, he also had a online search that showed that the resident in the apartment at issue is the mother of Mr. Eck. And it says past residents include Mr. X. So these are all, you know, minimal um, evidences and allegations that he submitted that allowed this case to go forward to a hearing where then the parties could then prov provide the evidence to carry the uh, decision one way or the other based on what they provided. Okay. I, I do have, I, I do still want to, I guess, ask a very similar or the same question about the prima facie standard because of those things that were listed, uh, it seemed to me that the only one that's that seems to be potentially convincing is the security footage. You know, having one photo of a car parked somewhere else doesn't seem to be relevant to this. And some of those other issues that were raised, again, I think that the the security footage is what seems potentially persuasive here, and it doesn't seem realistic to me that that uh, somebody would have reviewed over four thousand hours of security footage to determine that somebody wasn't present. So what I'm trying to understand is, was there something besides the security footage that would meet the threshold of prima facie? Let me just address the issue of the security footage, because um, I think I'm now understanding um, what, what, you're what you're talking about as far as having a difficult time understanding why that was accepted. So at this stage of the process, um, we are accepting uh, the evidence and the allegations that the landlord puts forth as true because at the hearing stage that's when they're tested that's when the tenant will have the opportunity to do just what you said to question the authenticity of the video question whether it's realistic to have someone review that thing and that's uh, where the hearing officer then also has the opportunity to ask those more probing questions at the initial stage those questions aren't answered. If there's sufficient evidence presented that can get us to the hearing stage, then that is accepted at that point. We, we don't go into, at that point, um, the credibility uh, or the reliability of the evidence. So then is it, would it be the case that anybody making any accusation that's relevant to what, uh, to relevant to, in this case, the, uh, tenant not an occupancy claim any any accusation whatsoever would just because they stated it would qualify no because that's not what we're dealing with here he's saying he has footage and he showed some has actual footage and he's saying he reviewed it so there's actually an actual basis for the allegation so again it's it's a prima facie case so you know and and there's a reason for that too we want to make sure um that there's a standard so that the landlord doesn't have to go through the tenant's garbage, for example. You know, we don't want that there to be required this intrusion in order to get to a hearing. But at the same time, we also want to make sure there's a mechanism for someone to make a credible allegation and then an opportunity for the tenant to respond to that. The tenant is probably in the best position to prove where they live. Um, but then at the hearing stages when they'll have that opportunity to refute not only the landlord's evidence, but then to present their own affirmative evidence of their primary residence. So once we get to the hearing 
and everything that's in the staff report, the burden is now on the tenant. The tenant carries the burden. So all the evidence here, we're looking for the tenant to meet that burden. The landlord met their burden by filing this and getting it accepted, correct? So because I think we're kind of conflating the prima facie case with the burden shifting standard in the hearing. That's right. Once you get to the hearing stage, then the tenant has to prove that that's their primary, their usual residence of return. I would just say that for me, it's not conflating those issues. It's precisely because that burden shifts that it's of concern to me that that initial threshold is met by the first party. Threshold. You're looking because, at the looking right, because the, threshold. we say that, okay, well, in the hearing, the, the, the sides can come together and present their evidence, but it's not like you just make a phone call for an hour and do that. It, this process has gone on since when did, this was filed. The notice was given, I think, in December. So we're almost a full year into this at this point, where your not only is your time a great time demand placed on you when that the burden shifts to you to prove your innocence, but your privacy is completely invaded. There's comment in this report about in in sort of reference to the fact that they're married but don't live together. That's completely an invasion of privacy, in my opinion. So there's all kinds of things that become a large burden once that that once that burden shifts to the tenant. So I, I want to make sure that this case should have been heard in the first place. And that's what I'm trying to understand here. But that's I mean but that's just the regulation. So I mean we would have to we would have to amend the regulation t to change the burden shifting standard. I'm not I'm not I'm not raising a problem with the regulation. I'm ra I'm ra I'm questioning if that if the burden was met to bring it to a hearing in the first place for the petition to be accepted. So but that's Let's hear, I, I'm going to chair this meeting. Yeah, of course. We, I've got some people in the queue waiting to speak, and it's Commissioner Gwynn and then Vice Chair Leslie. I, I'm going to wait because mine is a different. More discussion. I'll stay on this. Okay. On this topic. Vice Chair Leslie. <laughs> so my question is, as you go through this case, I also see there's also a history of tenant harassment. So was that taken into consideration anywhere in here when this was filed? Because I do see some things as being rather invasive as, as well, um, going in through both parties when the other property as well, when the, con the unit of concern is at another address. Are you referring to the investigator? Yes. So we don't have any authority to compel any type of an inspection, so those are all voluntary and consented to. So that's a staff investigator. That's not the landlord. The landlord had nothing to do with that. The staff calls the tenant in question and, and, and attempts to schedule those. And if they're amenable to that, then those are scheduled. Are you referring to the, to the appellant's accusations of a tenant harassment case? Or are you talking about the evidence that was gathered at the hearing? Well, I'm talking about the evidence. I'm talking about the the previous case of tenant harassment. Uh, I want to know if all, all right. those things were taken in consideration as this was filed. So, because as, it, once again, it, I know it's at, at will or, you know, as long as they're amicable for it. Um, however, when you have a couple that is living or, you know, they're cohabitating on, you know, one prop property and then possibly on another where I also looked through here and saw that there were no, you, you're not allowed to have overnight guests. Um, as far as I, it's stated in here, the, the owner says or the manager says you cannot have overnight guests. Once they're married, they're no longer overnight guests. That's also. So, may I, one moment, please. So, I, I, had, I had that same question yeah. today. And um, there's, a, there's a difference between what's in the record and what, an appellant, whether it's a landlord or a tenant, writes in an essay mm -hmm. in their appeal. And the problem with things being introduced that are not in the record, because the hearing officer was presented with evidence of some other prior case, and she chose for legal reasons not to consider it. Then the appellant writes it in their appeal to us. Mm -hmm. It's untested. It's un cross-examined, it's not, so the reason we can't accept knowledge of things that are simply Previous. written, yeah. if it's not in the record, is because 
then the landlord hasn't, like if, if we just accept that he's telling the truth, it's been untested by a hearings officer, by any uh, cross-examination, by any exam. So that the, the tenant harassment case that the appellant refers to in his commentary is not in the record. So I thought there was a case number attached to that. It's, Am I mistaken? You want to take? Or you, what are you referring to, Commissioner, where you said there's a case number attached? The appellant referred to a tenant harassment case between himself and the landlord at a different time, and she does make notice of it in the report, but says it was not I think, I think, Commissioner Leslie, what, you, what you're referring to is there is a mention in the record of a prior case where there was a settlement. So that, I think what the hearing officer was doing was simply summarizing the testimony during the hearing, but that testimony was ultimately not relevant to what the case was about before her. So she accurately summarized what came up during the hearing, and I think it was the landlord who actually referenced uh, the settlement of that of that case. Um, but ultimately, that did not bear on the facts before the hearing officer. I think what the hearing officer was trying to convey was that this is a very contentious, I don't think anyone would disagree that this is a contentious relationship between Absolutely. the two, but I think what's important um, to focus on is whether or not there was substantial evidence to support the hearing officer's determination ultimately that the tenant is no longer in occupancy. And so my question for staff before we move on is, um, thank you, that led right into my question. So one of the things that stood out to me about this case was that it's pretty rare for a tenant not to participate very much in their own defense uh, and to offer things that could have been offered, photos or evidence or dates or testimony of partners and spouses and mothers and all these people. So it's it seems that the case was um, adjudicated and and that the hearing officer didn't have a whole lot to rely on because the parties didn't populate the record with a whole lot of stuff. And so um, can you just explain a little bit about the preponderance standard and what that exactly means and, and what is enough? Sure. So the preponderance of the evidence standard means simply a tip of the scales. So 51... Not beyond a reasonable doubt. No, it's just one side tips the scales more than the other side. Um, and as far as, you know, I don't know if any of you had had an opportunity to actually review the, the hearing in this case, but the hearing officer has the opportunity not only to hear the testimony, but also to look at the witnesses as they're testifying, to gauge their credibility, to gauge their demeanor. Um, I can't sit here, I don't think any of us can speculate as to why certain testimony was or was not introduced, why evidence was not introduced. Um, but the hearing officer is in the best position to ascertain um, the, again, the demeanor of the participants and to assess uh, their testimony uh, and to weigh the evidence. And, and that's why in this capacity, you know, as difficult, and, and these are difficult cases, I am not going to lie to you, um, you know, and this is a close case. I think this is one of those cases where, you know, the hearing officer has evidence, you've got contradictory evidence on all sides, right? And so that's where you go back to the standard of review, which is even if there's contradictory evidence, if there is also evidence that supports the hearing officer's decision, as hard as that is, then um, the answer is to affirm. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gwynn, do you want to ask a question of staff before yeah, we go on? It, and this is just kind of what you explained, just in the determination of the MAR, um, when they determined the com com comparing the units, the only true evidence, as it turns out, evidence, is of what the other apartment was, is what the owner provided. 
And in this case, that meant that the hearing officer felt that he was believable and in what he was giving, because that's the only thing she get. And so that's that's uncontroverted. Right. So in that case, that's why that that was used as the evidence. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, we need to move on. Thank you for entertaining all of us and our questions. Um, for the public's edification, uh, what we do is we have a staff report. And if we have questions of staff, we ask them at that time before any public speakers speak and before we actually enter the formal discussion phase where we may reveal our predisposition or our new conclusions that we are reaching as a consensus on the dais. So at this point, um, we do have one request to speak. Uh, Mr. Mustafa Eck, you can go ahead and come up to the microphone. And as a party to the action, you'll have up to five minutes. You don't have to use it, but you are free to have that time if you wish. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just, obviously I'm here to speak about this case because it's very personal to me. It's my home. Um, I, I'm, you brought, there's many issues that I wanted to bring up today that you guys are discussing, one of which was this, this initial burden of proof. Um, as a citizen, as just a person who lives in Santa Monica, I had no choice, you know, my only resource is to go to the rent control office here and learn about how these things work. I'm a person who travels frequently for work. I was in Egypt when I got this report to say that I don't live in my apartment. And then immediately, okay, I have to, now I'm on the defensive. And again, I have this, I don't know how it's not relevant, but my landlord was sued by the city of Santa Monica for tenant harassment. I don't know how that's irrelevant, but uh, I have a very contentious relationship where I'm constantly attacked for one reason or another. I could easily write an essay about how to kick out your tenant in Santa Monica if you're, a, if you're a landlord. It's not that hard. Being on the receiving end of it, it's not that hard at all. Um, so when I came back, I had to learn about this process and how, you know, okay, now I'm in, de I'm in defense. How do we, you know, when he initially f uh, filed this paperwork, um, uh, what, are, what, is, what does he have to do to prove that I don't live in my apartment? All of those things that he said in his report were overturned. He, he, you know, he said in his report things as flimsy as he hasn't lived in his apartment since 2018, maybe longer. And then when we got to the to the to the hearing, the hearing officer said, "Do you have you know where did that claim come from?" Oh, I, I, just a hunch, like that kind of imperfect science. I, I was really surprised that there wasn't like a little bit more of a sophisticated burden of proof. Just I don't think he lives there. I did an internet search. It said his mom lives there. I don't know. I, I went and looked and saw what that was based on nothing. I then had to show years of records, you know, dig them up from uh, Spectrum. They don't even provide you years. They'll, just, they'll give you two, two years uh, uh, maximum. I had to take pictures of the, of the thing on there. there. It's a totally imperfect system, this whole thing, um, especially if you have an aggressive landlord. <coughs> um, so all of the things that he brought up were sort of overturned from my perspective. Um, and again, going back to my tenant harassment case, my landlord accuses me of something every time I see him. The, the second he moved into my apartment complex, he tried to force me out. Oh, sir, 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 yes. I've got to stop you. So to keep the record clean, you need to um, you need to refine your comments to things that are in the record. You're not allowed to present new yes, evidence. It's relevant. Sure, OK. Um, Anyhow, I, I, I was very surprised at this at this uh, conclusion. I'm surprised that the the tenant harassment is not somehow factored into this. I'll leave that to you guys. Uh, and I'm also didn't understand. You know, my apartment was dug through. Every tiny detail was. Po you know, this is sort of a uh, this was a process that was weaponized against me. I said, okay, you don't really have. You said it's a. You know, it's. It's uh, the it's at will if the tenant wants to allow people to come in. Of course, I mean, what are my choice? I can get kicked out of my apartment, or I'm forced to have someone tear every single look at underneath everything for hours. They spend like 30 minutes in each room and tear everything apart. And that person found that I lived in my apartment and looked at my wife's apartment where I have literally nothing, not one item. I've never moved anything over there. I don't have a piece of furniture. I don't. I have a few pieces of clothes. 95% of it is in my apartment, my clothes, and my all of my possessions. I don't have any possessions. That's what the investigator found, or you know, the person that goes through all your stuff. So, I, yeah. And, and secondly, going back to the MAR, the, the tenant, the, the landlord is incentivized, obviously, what they're looking for is to 
is to win. So I was really surprised with the level of uh, scrutiny that I went through in terms of determining my residence. And then, and then you determine a MAR based on what the landlord says and don't even look, just if you were to open the doors and look at the two apartments next to each other, it's not a $150 difference. Like, please come and look at my apartment. Have a look. I don't know. You, you came and looked for my stuff. Go and look at the apartments. They're next to each other. You can come into mine anytime you want. Like, it's, I, it's just such an imperfect science, the whole thing. I don't understand how that was determined. Just $150, I guess, seems right, without looking at it. Do real estate agents do that? I, I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I, I see here that I'm running out of time, but I guess what I would ask is just, you know, to sort of consider, uh, you know, looking deeper into the MAR, understanding uh, the, bur I, the burden of proof thing. I just don't understand that, you know. The level of proof. Thank before you. before you sit down, um, so uh, just for clarification, uh, which is the only kind of question we're allowed to ask you, we're not engaging in conversation with you during your public comment because we can't do that, but I can ask you a clarifying question. I'd like to do so really quickly. Um, in the staff report, it talks about the standards and the, the standards of, of proving that you do live uh, in the apartment, and one of those is um, taking examples of nights or things, you know, nights you spent in the apartment, and it talked a couple of different times. I was curious why your wife and your mother weren't participating and offering dates when you did did sleep in the apartment or when your wife could, could have said he was not in my apartment these nights, and they did not, you did not um, have them participate. I'm very happy. That's a great question. Uh, you may not like the answer, but my, again, going back to my tenant harassment, my landlord refused to allow me to have a roommate. And I moved in there with a roommate. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, during the hearings process, this is part, when this there is part, was part of time. The answer. That's part of the answer. Okay, please okay. refine your answers to I'm, just, I'm just that I'm giving you part. some background. This is 100,000% true, so I can only just tell you the truth. It may not be relevant in the framework of this conversation, but this okay, is Okay, go, go right ahead. So, um... So the reason that I did not bring them is because my landlord attacks me at every opportunity he can. That is a fact. It's not part of the record. Maybe it's somehow irrelevant to this conversation. But if somebody is constantly attacking you, if somebody walks into your apartment and sees... Sir, please, you're, you're elaborating okay. too much. Let me give you one, a quick one, two-sentence uh, response. Thank you. The reason that I did not bring them into this situation is because my landlord, from my perspective, is a predator. The last time I had someone in my apartment, he said, when he walked in there, he said, you are not allowed to have tenants. Just asking about this testimony. I, I, That's the I, I reason. I would like to hear, I think, I think let's just let him finish because I think he's it's trying not, to. It's not in the record and it's not it germane. He's trying to, he's trying to answer your question to state that, to, to help you understand why he didn't bring them into I'd like process. to consult our general counsel. Should, should, uh, a public speaker go into depth that's not in the record? Well, I, I, I would actually say that I think your question is eliciting that. I, I think the, his motivation in why his testimony was or Hold was on, I'm not listening to her. the way that it was, I think is also not germane. You have before you the record that you have before you. Um, why certain evidence wasn't presented is not part of the record. Okay, thank you. That's all we have for you at this Actually, time. I have, I have a question. All right, uh, Commissioner Gonska has a, a clarifying question for you. Uh, so in the record, um, the hearing officer in, in more than one place uh, refers to your answers about uh, how often you were, uh, you were using or at the, the, the apartment um, by making reference to things like that you said, uh, I'm trying to find it here just to, to quote it, um, he currently spends more than 50% of his time at the 11th Street property. Uh, and I think in another place it was something like slightly more or a bit more than half of the time. So just to clarify, are you, were you referring to, when you say it, more than 50% of the time at the 11th Street apartment, are you referring to the portion of time when you're in town and not away on tr travel for work, for example? Yeah, my, I think we have a, dis, a, a miscommunication about that question. I didn't, the way that it was reiterated is not the way that I recall responding. What I think 
we're talking about is the amount of time that I'm in town, not in general, because I'm never here. I'm always, I work in the film industry. I'm constantly moving around. So it's probably more than 50% of the time that I'm in Los Angeles is probably what we're talking about. Not in general. That, that's my question. If, is it 50%? Uh, is, are you spending slightly more than 50%? If we can all agree that a month is 30 days on average, yeah. Yeah. are you saying that you are spending slightly more than 50% of, of 30 days, so slightly more than 15 days at the 11th Street property, or slightly more than 50% of the time you're in Los Angeles? I'm sorry. I, I think I got lost. I think I'm, I'm just I'm saying in, while while in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's my question. That's my question. Exactly. So you're, so you're stating that it's 50% of the time that you're here. So there are excusable reasons to be away from a property for an extended period of time, as was described in the initial report uh, or the initial yeah uh, description of the report. So Do you have a question for him. That was my question. Okay. You just answered it. I also have a question about. Uh, the the roommate situation. Did you ever file a petition or consider or have conversation about filing a petition for a rent decrease for not being able to bring in a roommate? Have I ever done it or have I ever considered it? Either. Um, I have. I have. You know, my. I, I have done. I have considered it. My general policy is just to live my life peacefully. I don't know if you know. I'm not trying to interact with my landlord. I'm just trying to live for the most part. Everything is contentious. If I need to change the plumbing, if I want to whatever, it's all contentious by design. So I just try to stay away for the most part. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Ivanoff, do you have a question for? Yeah, can you just clarify for me? Um, so was it your testimony a few minutes ago that um, when the hearing examiner went to your wife's apartment or wife's house that none of your personal possessions were there? Yeah, okay. that's in the record. All right. Your investigation. Thank you so much. You can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony. Um, all right. We're going to move into the discussion phase of this case. Commissioners, take a moment, gather your thoughts, and let me know who would like to go first in the discussion of their viewpoint of how they're going to vote. Okay. I'll go. Um, so it's not that this case wasn't different, it's not that it wasn't difficult, but it's also not that it was special. It's not special. It, you know, the hearings department, uh, our hearings process, like many other laws in many other cities, are, are cultivated and carved and changed over time by court cases, by um, processes, by elected officials, by, by time going by and modernization happening and things changing. And people, humans, identify pro, you know chinks in processes that we need to fix over time. And no one is saying that that a TNIO process or a rent decrease petition or any other petition is perfect. But uh, I don't see an error under our standard that our hearings examiner committed. I don't see an error. It doesn't mean I don't find strangeness in, in some of the facts or in the way that this case unfolded. I do. Um, and it doesn't mean I don't want to take a look at our TNIO process over time, um, off this dais and, and with staff's cooperation and um, expertise. I do. But not tonight. Um, and I, I, I do. I'm glad we had this discussion. I'm glad we got to, you know, delve deeper into the tenant not in occupancy process. And all the ones I've ever heard in seven plus years of sitting on this dais, this was the most interesting one, quite frankly. I, I, most of them are more, much more straightforward. Um, but even though this one wasn't straightforward, it still met the standards. And the, the system still worked. I'd, you know, Will we take a look at the process in the future? I think we will. But I cannot find error uh, in this case. Waiting for names. <laughs> Commissioner Ivanov. I just want to hear from, from my fellow board members that had concerns about the initial process and that the initial prima facie burden not being met, the threshold. Can you clarify for me what specifically why you thought the threshold was not met? Because we saw the petition, the proper paperwork was filled out, supporting documentation was attached. I'm not I'm not understanding why the initial threshold was not met. If if the landlord had just filled out the form and said, I don't think this guy lives here, 
without any documents, emails, video surveillance, it would not have been accepted in the first place. But then I would understand you saying the threshold was not met. He just threw out some random accusation without providing any documentation in support of it. But I don't see that being an issue here. So once again, so once that is that was accepted, the burden then falls on the tenant. Everything we have in the staff report is up to the tenant to to meet that burden. So can you just clarify for me what is the concern that the initial threshold was not met? What specifically? Uh, the fact that there yeah, there are accusations made, but I don't see any sort of uh, verification of those or av actual evidence laid out. It's just an accusation. It can't be no verification involved at the prima facie level because the courts have held that it's a slight evidence, it's a slight standard, and what so long as there is slight evidence from which one can draw a reasonable inference that proves the elements of the case, that's sufficient. And so, for example, in this case, the fact that the, la the landlord contended that he reviewed the security camera footage and didn't see the gentleman there at the time, or that his, or that his car was observed at his wife's apartment, which is close by, and so he says that he actually lives there, or he does internet searches and he finds that uh, various things related to him not being actually in the unit. All of those things, there are slight evidences from which, if they're not refuted, would be sufficient to establish that he doesn't live there. It's at the hearing where those things can be challenged and and overturned, and we've already had that discussion. So, so can you just clarify what you just said? That you said if they're not refuted, or it, so long the the prima facie standard is. You, you just accept that if they're not refuted, that that's sufficient to meet the standard. So how would they be refuted? And that that's part what happens at the hearing. That, that my point is that the prima facie at the prima facie setting, there is no verification involved. You just accept that the evidence that's been presented, if the if it's not refuted at the hearing, it, it, it leads to a decision finding the tenant not an occupant. So is is prima facie is the determination of if that threshold has been met at the time that the petition is reviewed or at the time of the hearing? No, the time of the hearing. So again, this is minimal evidence to, to warrant a hearing, to warrant further exploration, and then to give the tenant the opportunity to then present evidence in, in uh, refutation of that initial showing. Okay, so j just to clarify, I'm not still, I'm not s here trying to convince you that that threshold okay. wasn't met. That's what initiated, those questions are what initiated me bringing that question here tonight to the staff that and we've had extensive extensive conversation about that so to me then that's that has been satisfied um, I think that I'm sorry you're still recognized so I don't know if you have any other questions before no, I, I go just, on. I okay just clarity on, we talked about earlier before we even got to the speaker in the discussion concerns about the initial threshold not being met right so I just wanted that's the, but I, I got it yeah, yeah. If, if if the question is why I had those concerns, it's because of the things I've already stated. The fact that it's not believable to me that that the things that this person said they did, such as reviewing four thousand plus hours of video footage, is not is not believable. So that's why I'm having questions about to making sure that that threshold was met, and those have been answered tonight. Um, there's one other thing, not to, not to belabor this case, but there's something we didn't really talk about that that um, that I spent a lot of time talking to staff about, um, which was the dollar amount, um, and and what my question was was not in, about this case, but more the process. How is a comparable price uh, a market rate? I think we all understand how you get a market rate, but then subtracting something that makes it comparable to um, the tenant's unit. That there, what I learned today or yesterday was that the parties build the record, the parties populate the record. Unlike uh, rent decrease petitions, where our where our employee goes out as an, a trained investigator and looks at how rusty is it, how leaky is it, how broken is it, um, what amenity is missing. Unlike that case, 
we don't send an investigator out to investigate the comparable. We rely on the parties to populate the record. And in this case, the landlord said, well, here's this other unit that rented for a lot. And I just did these couple nice things to it. The other party is supposed to do their homework and say, no, a wall was moved. So all those things that were attached were after the case was over. And so could have been presented during the, during the, the concurrent process of looking at what the comparable rent market rent would be, um, as, as your, as your, penalty for no longer residing in the unit, uh, according to the other half of the case. So there are always two halves of these cases. And this was a very interesting case study. It was a very interesting study. Um, seeing no more discussion, or, oh, you, that's a new item. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Commissioner Gonska. So uh, setting aside the prima facie threshold, because we've, we've discussed that uh, extensively tonight, I think that there are a number of things uh, in the in the record that lead me to believe that the preponderance of evidence uh, was not is not established here in support of the hearing officer's decision. Um, I can go into a few of them. I don't know how much time we want to spend on this, but uh, just to reference my notes here, um, one question I asked the tenant was about the amount of time he spends in the unit because there are several references to that in the, in the record. Uh, it's it's stated in the record as if he's saying that less than 50% of, of total time is spent at the unit when in actuality, based upon my reading of the here of the record, based upon his answer to my question here tonight, he's referring to the amount of time when he's in Los Angeles. So there are excusable reasons to be away from your unit, which is a portion of the month that he's on business travel. So he's spending 50%, a slight, he stated here that he's spending slightly more than 50% of the time that he's here. So if he's here for 15 days, he's spending, let's call it eight days, slightly more than half at his wife's apartment and call it six or seven at his apartment. That would be what I would look at is the amount of time that he's here, where is he spending it? Because the amount of time he's not here is excused based upon our, our rule, our regulation. Uh, so I feel like that was an error. Obviously, that's only one point that's considered in here, but it's referenced several times throughout. So I feel that it was heavily weighed. Uh, there are numerous pieces in the record where a neighbor made a comment, quote, uh, when Mr. Uh, a neighbor was asked, a woman who was at the 11th Street property was asked if Mr. Eck resided at that property, and she responded, quote, yeah, she's his wife, end quote. And the hearing officer goes on to explain that while hearsay evidence can't be, uh, while uh, it can't, this statement constitutes hearsay evidence, as the woman was not present at the hearing to testify regarding her statements, hearsay evidence all, alone cannot be used to prove a material fact. However, it can be used to corroborate other evidence. There, um, also, there's speculation on the hearing officer's part about the fact that the two units are so close together could be a reason why all that other evidence where utility bills, the car registration, a whole list of things that are in the record were sort of in a roundabout way explained why those weren't given a lot of weight was because the two units are so close together that the person could go back and pick up the mail and whatnot. That's pure speculation. So to me, a lot of the majority of the information that supports his claim that he lives in that unit was given less weight. And the part that was given a lot of weight, to me, is misinterpreted, being the time, the amount of time he spent at the unit while he's in town. Uh, so that's, that's just on the first part of this case, which is, is he actually a tenant at that unit? Or is he in an occupancy of that unit? Then the second part, as the chair stated, is I see several issues with the new MAR that was determined by the hearing officer of only $150 less. Uh, some of it is related to what the regulations require, which is not something we can change here tonight. Uh, in particular, the fact, as the tenant stated, that the hearing officer doesn't actually view the comparable unit just takes the word of the two people involved in the case. Um, 
So th th there's two main parts, and I think that I find significant errors in both of those those two elements of this. Um, so I, I do have a question for staff, but I'm willing to let any other commissioners ask questions or speak before I do that. Commissioner Gwynn. And uh, Commissioner Gonska, I think if we, it's, if we interpret the first question, the first thing you have concerns with, the 50% thing, that negates the other one. We wouldn't even have to deal with it if we're saying that there is an incorrect in that. Correct. And I agree that there's there's some disparity in what the hearing officer even says within a report. Like you said, one time she in steer states that he says that when he's in town, 50% of the time, well, the actual words were not when he's in town, but when he's, you remember what it said? Um, I just had it here. Um, he says, Mr. Eck estimated that when in town, he spent roughly 50% of his time at the 11th Street property. And like you said, that that's 50% when he's in town, and he might only be in town 50% of the time. So that is an issue. And then later in the report, she says that he vaguely testified that he spends a little more than 50% of his time at the 11th Street property and doesn't delineate that that meant when he was in town. So I, do t I too, have difficulty with that, but that that's in could be an error, but the problem is, is that he needs to be, to be on his side of the situation, it needs to be more than 50% of the time, essentially, or at least 50% of the time, I would assume is what the standard would be. Um, so we're still in a case of, you know, if he was in town that other 50% of the time when he's not in town, does that mean it's 50% of that time that he would have been at the apartment? We don't know. So that's that's a difficult thing to assess, too. Yeah, and it seems to me, that, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. It seems to me that the implication here is that the hearing officer is is not considering that. Okay, so I'd like to make a comment on what you all are commenting on uh, quickly. So I I read it also that the time he's out of town doesn't count. He's working. It's fine. It, just, it doesn't even exist. Right. In, doesn't matter if it's 30 days or 3,000 days. It's just not talked about. She has to interpret a basket of evidence and give different weight to different things depending on what she's given by the parties. While it is true that he verbally said about 50% or more than 50%, he was just like every other witness to all these other parties and all these cases are given opportunities to prove it. And it's not that hard to prove to say like, well, this exact night I stayed there and this exact night I stayed there and that night I had trivia night because it was very recent. It was just a couple months ago. Um, so, I mean, it was just in the last few months. And when given opportunities to say, well, can your wife say about how many nights a week or any patterns you exhibit he did not participate. He did not offer any specific anything other than about 50% of the time. So what you're saying is you believe him more than the lack of, you know, than the evidence he could have presented. Even just one example ever of a day he spent the night at his apartment, but he cannot account for and did not account for even a single night. Uh, yeah, specifically at his apartment, whereas other tenants in other cases definitely have. Just to specifically address what you said that I was saying, I, I don't think that that's accurate. I think that I'm not stating who I believe or who the, who the hearing officer believes. I don't think it's that quite. I don't think anybody's disputing the 50 percent. That he, uh, what I'm saying is that if he's if he's excused for 50 for half the month, plus the roughly less than 50 percent of the time he's in town that he's at that apartment that he stated he was that to me is close to 75 percent right, of the total time that's all i'm stating numbers of nights are not the standard like percentage of time is is not the definition of whether it, we, it's we had used a tenant, to establish if he's actually using that tenant as his regular place it's one of the thing she could consider in a basket Correct. of things she's considering so we had a tenant uh not an occupancy case who was gone for three years on the east coast taking care of his dying mother and it just took her three years to to pass away and then he intended to return and did return so the 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 amount of time isn't necessarily 
that's one element of it. Right. And I've mentioned other elements like hearsay that a neighbor said went, went out of context, not understanding why the question was being asked and actually didn't provide much information at all, three or four words. Okay. Uh, the location of a parked car, apparently documented one time. So I'm, I'm going through several of those elements of usual place of return because all the other evidence, all the other that are listed in the regulation that should be considered appear to support the tenant. Well, basic so living that, activities. That doesn't is the part of the, the basket of things that are that are filled by things like the amount of time spent there, where the car is parked, all of those elements of it. So, so I'm focusing on just those, going through them. Okay. Um, I still don't see an error, though. I think I think she could have reached the conclusion she did based on what she was given. Uh, Commis uh, Vice Chair Leslie. Okay. I, I know you mentioned that uh, when the gentleman came back in, he wasn't stating exactly what night. When I think what needs to also be taken into consideration when you're going flying in and out of town, some things become a blur. <laughs> Just that simple. Um, he's flying in and out of town for business. He has to work out of town. He comes back in. Um, I guess he would, the burden, once again, is still on the tenant to put together plane tickets and see, you know, what movie did I watch? Was that here or was that out of town? I mean. I think this is also because it's rent control and we have to have a process because we are manipulating what price increase tenants can be assessed instead of just whatever the landlord wants to because it comes with certain responsibilities. And, and in my view, um, this evidentiary burden that is placed on the tenant, this invasion of privacy, as some have stated, mm -hmm. or, or having to account for your nights is part of the process of, of participating in a program like rent control. And it's also what the courts have said both parties have to do uh, to, to meet these standards. So again, I, so I feel like we've spent an hour on this case and, and, and it, we're going to start, I, I've just heard, we're starting to, we're all, myself, we're starting to rehash because we feel conflicted about it. I suggest um, at this point we call the question and see if somebody wants to make a motion uh, in the interest of, of keeping this going. I still have a question for staff. Okay. Commissioner Gonska. So as we've stated, as we, I think we're all clear on, there are two parts to this. One is if he is a tenant in occupancy. The other is the uh, new MAR that's determined by the hearing officer. So when it comes to the second part, the new MAR that's determined, um, Regulation 4024, it states that the board may also reverse and remand the decision to a hearing examiner to take additional evidence or reverse and remand a part of the decision and affirm, reverse and modify another part. But that, the first part of that sentence that we're able to remand, remand a decision to a hearing officer to take additional evidence, can you explain what that's referring to? Sure. So that's only in the case where there isn't, you don't believe there's sufficient evidence supporting the hearing officer's decision, and yet you're not prepared to um, reverse yourselves. You need to send it back. But there's still that threshold there that there's, there needs to be the finding that um, the decision is not supported by sufficient evidence. So if that, if that were, if the board were to vote to do that, what would the process look like for the, for the process to quote, take additional evidence? What would the process look like? Yeah, I mean, so do we need to give direction on what types of evidence would it, I mean, it seems it's kind of vague to take additional evidence. So would that reopen the hearing? Would it, yes. would the parties be able to present new evidence? What yes. Kind of things you would, would identify where the deficiency is and what exactly the information that you need. Okay. A question for staff as a follow up to that. Then what, and I mean this sincerely, then what is the difference between you should have present, it, it, either party, any landlord, any tenant, should have presented it during the hearing process and could have, it was available but didn't choose to versus it wasn't available then and it has since become available. Is that part of no. that so process? That's an excellent 
distinction. So you're not remanding to hear evidence that could have been presented at the time. I didn't, yeah, I didn't hear you address that in that yes. answer. Yes. What it, this requires is uh, at the at the outset is, a, first of all, a finding of error. So you're finding that there's no evidence to support the hearing officer's decision, but instead of reversing, you're saying we don't have the evidence we need to make our own decision here. We, that's why we send it back. But in the first instance, there has to be a finding of error. So uh, based upon that answer from the staff to my question, um, and as I described earlier, and happy to discuss more or happy to move to a vote based upon what the chair said before, uh, I, I find that there are many issues, there are many holes here in the hearing officer's uh, decision. Uh, I think that as a few of us have stated throughout this conversation, there are a lot of questions. There, are, This is very thin on evidence. Um, there are a lot of questions about why the tenant didn't provide more testimony and more evidence and more actual information. Um, and as was stated by another commissioner, many cases of the same type that have come before have been much more clear cut, have had more information. So I feel like this is a, a reasonable uh, approach here. I don't feel like I can sign, I can put my name to affirming this decision. Uh, and I think that there is additional evidence that could have been presented and that exists uh, that's not part of this record. So I think that the regulations allow for us to remand it and have the hearing examiner take additional evidence. Um, and so I think I'd like to hear what you guys' thoughts are on that. Commissioner Ivanov. So to the point about additional evidence, it seems to be the key thing that would really move the needle here would be, like we said, um, his wife and mother testifying, providing specific dates, specific events, things like that. He has explicitly said that he does not want them involved for specific reasons with the landlord. So he explained why that evidence was not taken into account in the record. So I don't see how, unless he changes his mind and decides that he does in the future want to bring them into this matter, that doesn't change. Additional evidence from that is not going to come in. So outside of that, what additional evidence are we thinking that we could gather if those people are not accessible? It's not, I'm I think sorry, it's a, I, I have to jump in. It's a second bite at the apple. I, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. This is not a second bite at the apple. Yeah. You have one hearing and an opportunity. You don't get to wait to see what the decision is right. to then try to come back again and say, well, I wanted to actually provide this evidence. But then what does, why does that regulation allow for to take additional evidence? I think that, as you stated before, we need to have found error. I've laid out the best way that I can over the course of the last hour the specific parts of the record that I think that there were error. So to me, we have the option to remand it and ask for and for the hearing officer. The only way to find, to, the only type of additional evidence that could possibly be brought forward is the tenant's wife and mother testify. There are all kinds of other things that could be, as Commissioner Leslie stated, flight records, different things that would state dates that he was in town or out of town. There's all kinds of other things that could have been, that can that could be brought forward uh, that would provide more clarification to this case. But he had the opportunity to do that and was asked to present exactly that during the hearing, and he chose not to. Outside of finding a clear error, that's the first step. We can't remand to collect additional evidence. We can't you guys, just remand. You guys, are all, you guys have, multiple people have said that, but... I'm not confused about that. I'm, I'm, I've am I'm, stated multiple times and I've pointed to specific things in the record of where I think their error was made. Okay, so, so I'm going to call the question and ask you to make a motion then. So, uh, 
So a uh, point of clarification here. I think the, the regulation says the board may also reverse and remand the decision to a hearing examiner to take additional evidence. So Correct. if I'm we. I'm sorry, you have to reverse. Yes. That has to be your motion to reverse and right. remand. So I motion to reverse and remand the decision to a hearing examiner to take additional evidence. Of the entire, both questions in that, both the MAR and the, and the actual occupancy. occupancy. Yes. No, no, actually, no, only on the, on the element of the tenant, the tenancy, because the, the problems that I see with the MAR determination are not an error. I think that that, that the hearing officer did follow the regulations there. I have an issue with the regulations, which would be dealt with separately. Okay. I do not hear a second. Uh, well, <laughs> speak up. <laughs> Vice Chair Leslie, are you seconding? I'm seconding. Uh, I would like to make a substitute motion to uh, deny the appeal and accept the findings and fact of, and conclusions of law. Second. All right. Please call the roll on the substitute motion. Commissioner Ivanov. Yes. Commissioner Gonska. No. Commissioner Gwynn. Yes. Vice Chair Leslie. No. Chair Foster. Yes. Motion carries. All right. That was an exercise in the public process. And why, while maybe not satisfactory for uh, everyone, I think we all learned a lot, and it was a healthy discussion. We thank the parties and thank staff for entertaining all of our questions, and we're going to move on. Uh, 10B3, a decreased petition, 1647 Ocean Front, Unit 4, um, Appellant C. Hicks, Tenant. Can we have a brief staff report? Commissioner, excuse me. <laughs> Commissioner, Charles Hicks, who's the tenant at 1647 Ocean Front Walk, Unit 4, filed a rent decrease petition alleging various maintenance conditions and reductions of housing services, and the hearing officer granted him $170 in rent decreases. He has appealed that decision, and he argues that he should have gotten additional decreases for the landlord's conduct that constituted tenant harassment and discrimination. But the board's regulations only grant rent decreases for maintenance conditions and reductions of housing services. They don't authorize decreases for tenant harassment or discrimination, and courts have specifically held that the board can't. Um, as discussed in greater detail in the staff report, San Francisco had exactly that provision, and the court struck it down because the court held that doing so was an invalid attempt at awarding general damages, which only a court can do. The hearing officer, therefore, followed the law in not awarding decreases for such conduct. Staff recommends that the board affirm the decision and its findings of facts and conclusions of law. Thank you for that report. Uh, we do not have any speakers on this item, so um, unless there are any questions for staff, we'll go into discussion. Commissioner Gwynn. Um, it doesn't look like there's any other discussion. I'd be willing to move this unless... You are free to make a motion at any time. I move a motion that we um, affirm the hearing officer's decision and findings of facts and conclusions of law and deny the appeal. Second. All right. Call the roll, please. Yes. Commissioner Gwynn. Yes. Commissioner Ivanov. Yes. Commissioner Gonska abstains. Absent. He's, you can just call the remaining names who are here. Uh, Vice Chair Leslie. Yes. Chair Foster. Yes. Motion carries. All right. Uh, that does it for those items. We'll move on to uh, a presentation. But first of all, I want to I want to ask: um, Does Brian Augusta have a flight to catch tonight? No. Okay. <laughs> Just in consideration of our local versus our traveled uh, guests tonight. Um, I'm very excited about this presentation by Consumer Protection Unit Chief Deputy Attorney Romy Ganchow and Deputy City Attorney Denise McGranahan on the proposed Tenant Protection Ordinance um, that was initiated by uh, Council Member Carolyn Tarosis, along with other Council Members. Direction was given to 
city staff, and part of that direction was to run this past the uh, rent control board, and here they are. We, we thank you for your timeliness and how quickly that came about, and we're very excited to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and like we do so many things, we're going to be doing this totally together, tag teaming, so you'll have two of us up here together. My name's Romy Ganshaw. I'm the Chief Deputy City Attorney for the Consumer Protection Unit. Um, been here since October 2nd and previously spent several years in Lafla Santa Monica office, so dealt a lot with uh, the same population here. And I'm Denise McGranahan. Um, there are a bunch of you I don't know very well, but some <laughs> I do. Um, and I've been working in um, basically on these issues since 1996 <laughs> and before that. So um, I am now at the city attorney's office after 23, 27 years at LAFLA. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks. So are you, will you be advancing? Great. So we'll just do a very, very quick initial overview of why we're here. So um, as the chair said, on uh, October 20 or August 22nd, um, there was a 16 item um, put forward by several of the council members um, requesting basically for uh, the city attorney's office to propose some tenant protection resolutions. Just some of the background on this, where they, the 16 items cited, um, you know, a, a significant increase in unlawful detainers being filed, um, kind of a, a boom back to filing unlawful detainers after the COVID pandemic, the expiration of a lot of the COVID eviction protections and the looming final deadline for some of the um, eviction protections, including rent payment deadlines for some of the finally deferred rent, the stress on the market from the entertainment strikes, inflation, stagnant wages, um, and also a reference to the fact that the city of LA had passed some helpful protections uh, earlier this year that um, sort of were the inspiration for some of what was asked for this time. Um, there's also recognition that tenant protection is a homelessness prevention strategy um, and also included in this 16 item, which we're not really here today to talk about, but was just a further request to explore the feasibility of rent registries and uh, right to counsel program. Um, but what we specifically in the city attorney's office were asked to do was to draft ordinances concerning um, the adopting additional renter protections, including but not limited to. So this was not, we were kind of asked to think broadly, and that's part of why we're here tonight, but um, the specific things we were asked to do were to draft ordinances related to limiting evictions uh, based on non-payment of rent for small rental debts, which is, again, modeled off something they did in the city of LA, uh, an ordinance to require relocation assistance when a tenant is essentially involuntarily displaced because of a large rent increase, so economic displacement, of which we have a version, sort of a version like that for tenants who are removed from uh, units are exempted from rent control, but this would be an expansion of that. Um, and also some changes to the buyout agreement ordinance. So that was the explicit things we were asked to do, but also to come back with other things um, in service of the general um, motivation behind this to protect the 70% of Santa Monica uh, renter population. So Denise is going to talk about some of the initial um, eviction protections that we've come up with so far. So the, the one that, that uh, Council Member Tesoros was most interested in at first is this um, idea of limiting evictions for uh, non-payment of um, less than one month's rent. Um, in, in the, in the um, direction, it, it said one month's rent, but the City of LA's ordinance um, is one month of FMR, the fair market rent. and. Um, in thinking about it, rents in Santa Monica are higher than in Los Angeles, generally. So when I was thinking about how to do this, I was trying to figure out the measure. And so I came up with the idea of making it 150% of the FMR, although there are other choices. Um, this would be an affirmative defense in an eviction case. Um, it's a homeless prevention strategy, and it would mit mitigate evictions exacerbated by the pandemic. So when Los Angeles passed this in January of 23, um, <clears throat> part of the idea was, you know, if you lost your job and you couldn't pay your, you know, pay your rent, you had to apply for unemployment, there would be a, a bit of a, a delay in getting that unemployment. So people shouldn't get evicted for de minimis amounts of rent. And 
So at first, um, Agla sued um, March 3rd, 2023, claiming um, that in this particular instance, because they also challenged the relocation part of the other ordinance, um, what they claimed that the state law 1161 subsection 2 preempts uh, this particular ordinance and a preliminary injunction was denied by Judge Beckoff in May. Um, and he said at that time that he didn't think Agla had demonstrated an, a strong probability of prevailing on the merits, that the city had the police power and no preemption um, was there because it was a substantive, not a procedural ground for eviction, citing both Birkenfeld and the Rental Housing Association. But we just learned that on November 8th, there was a hearing where Judge Beckoff kind of reversed his viewpoint on this, unfortunately, but it's not set in stone because he hasn't adopted his tentative, but let me explain what he essentially is saying. He's saying that although this was initially designed to deal with the de minimis rent, you know, loss of rent, a tenant could each month pay less than the threshold and delay the ability of the landlord to serve a three-day no notice for a year. And maybe the, from the tentative ruling, assuming it is procedural, because he says that's essentially, um, he said it was, a, um, it was really a, um, a procedural limitation on the timing of eviction. I don't know if it is or not. I mean, we have some good case law on sub, what's substantive versus procedural. Um, I can see his argument. But, and that may dictate how we want to look at this or this proposed ordinance. Maybe we limit it to doing it once a year or something like that so that we don't run into this problem. But I think we want to see what his ultimate decision is before we actually um, move forward on that. So I think that's an interesting kind of development that just happened essentially yesterday. So, um, but um, this ordinance, if we were able to move forward with it, so, I mean, I mentioned the measures of, of what we could use. 150% um, of FMR was one option. We could, there are other choices like looking the, at the small area FMRs. Can you, can you spell out your um, acronyms? Sure. Brief, the F fair market rent for the Los Angeles Long Beach Glendale is published periodically by HUD. And um, the 2024 numbers are on the, on the screen. Above them is 150% based on my calculations. If someone finds an error, please let me know because I am not a mathematician, but I think they're right. Um, and, um, anyway, uh, and I did look at some, you know, recent rent uh, information about the differences between LA and Santa Monica. Now, this is not looking at the rent control rents specifically, although Tracy and I had spoken about possibly using your annual report and taking the rents out of that, but there's that's not published as frequently, and so it would be harder to do in that sense. So, But that is certainly on the table. Um, there, there's also the choice of using the small area fair market rents that are published by HUD every, every um, year by zip code in the entire country, or the small area FM, FMRs that the housing authority is now using because they switched to that program, those are a little bit adjusted. They're not the straight zip code numbers, but it seems like it would be hard to say if you live in 90403, the standard is one thing, and if you live in 90401, the standard is something else, and I think it would just be un sort of unfair to tenants. So we didn't like that. The, you could also average those numbers and it turns out that when you average them, it's pretty close to 150% of the FMR. So I think that's just the simplest number if we move forward with this to use. The ordinance would look um, essentially like this, definition of the fair market rent, and that it's an affirmative defense under both charter provisions, A1 and A, and both 1806 and 2304, if, um, if the amount that's owed is less than 150% of the fair market rent for an equivalent size rental unit as that occupied by the tenant. Also, um, as it is in LA, they have a requirement that the landlord has to put down the number of bedrooms on the actual three-day notice, and not doing that would be an affirmative defense. And I think that adding what the 150% fair market rent number is to that as well 
would be important because I don't know how a tenant's going to know what what that is, and it also might deter some filing of evictions when the landlord realizes that this is, you know, under 150 percent. So, um, you know, we've so that that's essentially that ordinance. But we have to sort of kind of measure what happens and figure out whether we want to move forward with that. Um, okay, so the next um, ordinance um, that we've thought of is something I don't know if, if any of you have actually even considered, but we at LAFLA and at the city attorney's office, we have had a number of cases where um, tenants had, especially long-term tenants, had done work in their apartments usually work that was either given, they were given permission to do by a prior landlord, or there was nothing in their lease, they had an oral tenancy agreement, nothing that said they couldn't do it. So they were could do it. So they would do it. And in fact, we have a case that we were handling right now where, you know, the, ten the tenant was accused of making a change to her apartment and actually um, hadn't made it, but the landlord was like, I'm, you know, going to evict you because you didn't get a permit. So this kind of stuff comes up where tenants are accused of nuisance for not um, pulling permits and they're calling that a nuisance per se. So if the tenant gets approval for the physical alteration or didn't have a problem in the first place making it, but this new landlord comes along and says, uh uh, I want I'm I'm gonna I'm looking for a reason to evict you. And that is the reason. And it has worked in a number of cases. Um, so we want to prevent that from happening. The problem is when you get cited by code enforcement, the landlord gets cited. The landlord might be given choices about what to do. For example, in a bootleg unit, they may say, you can take that garage and you can pull some permits and you can make it you know, compliant with the code, or you can convert it back to a garage. And who gets to make that choice? Not the tenant. The landlord is the only one who can make that choice. And the landlord is the only one who can pull a permit in the city. And we have seen cases, and we have one right now, where the landlord said, you need to pull a permit to do this, but we're not helping you. And the whole reason for doing that is to get rid of the tenant. So we want to prevent those types of evictions. So the idea is to, um, I think we can go to um, the next slide, actually. Um, so, um, we would propose a new uh, new provision, 4.27.100B2. Wait, I maybe mean, we have to go back. I'm so sorry. Yeah, B1. You were right. <laughs> <laughs> so we would, um, essentially it would be an affirmative defense under 1806A3, 2, 3, and 4, which is um, breach of lease, nuisance, and I think the... Uh, What's the fourth one? Refusal to enter? No, I can't remember what the other one is now. Anyway, two, three, and four, but I'll have to go back and look at those. And then um, where the basis... Use maybe? Yeah, it might be. Where the, where the basis for the eviction is that the tenant failed to obtain a permit or to otherwise comply with Articles 8 or 9 of the, of the, um, the municipal code in making physical alterations to the unit or the landlord received a notice of violation caused by the tenant's failure to obtain a permit or otherwise comply with Articles 8 or 9 in making physical, physical alterations to the unit if one of the three requirements are met. The tenant had expressed or implied consent to make those alterations by the landlord, including the former landlord in the definition. The t or the rental agreement allowed the tenant to make the alterations or did not prohibit them from doing it. Or the tenant was unable to obtain a permit due to the lack of cooperation of the landlord after receiving consent. So it's pretty limited. And then in under B2, the affirmative defense would be the landlord receives a notice of violation that the landlord asserts was the tenant's fault. And the landlord did not does not provide it within five days. One of the other issues is there's nothing that requires the landlord to even tell the tenant about it, to give the tenant an opportunity to even correct the problem within any particular period of time. So then the landlord can say, well, I got this NOV, and the tenant didn't fix it, and then evict the tenant. And then the last one would be uh, an affirmative defense if the landlord receives an NOV and blames the tenant for the following, and the following requirements are met. The only the landlord can appeal, seek a variance, or correct a violation, and the tenant timely requested the landlord to appeal, seek a variance, or allow the tenant to correct 
and the landlord declined. I don't know if you remember the fence case, the women with the fence who had the fence for like ever and it was allowed in her lease. The landlord went to code, self-reported it, code cited. She felt unsafe without the fence. She didn't take the fence down. She got evicted. And she had no ability to go for a variance in that case. I was very frustrated by that case when it came about. I thought this was really unfair to the tenant. So that's really what this one is about. So um, I will move on to the, um, I think, permanent relocation. I'm yeah. going to pass it over to Rummy. So this was the other, uh, sort of the second piece of the explicit request from council. Um, so one of the things that uh, we would propose to do is we already have this in our ordinance now, which is uh, so if a tenant's living in a unit that uh, is a rent controlled unit that is granted an owner occupancy exemption. So and so is now taken off of rent control. And then now that the unit's exempt from rent control, the landlord proposes to increase the rent more than they would have been allowed under rent control. Our current ordinance allows the tenant to receive to just take permanent relocation for that, although it's worded in a way that sort of is not clear that the tenant gets to elect to do that. If they want to stay and write out the higher rent increase, they have the right to do that. And that's sort of the intent. But this would just sort of clarify that language to make clear that it's the tenant's election. Thank you. That was ours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, I don't know that it's not working that way in practice, but you know, why not, since we're opening this up, have the opportunity to just make that clear. Um, and this carries through in some of the other things we've come up with with this. So, and then the, the new provision, um, what would be section A5, is to say um, allow any tenant who faces a rent increase that's greater than the amount that's authorized by the TPA um, to also elect to get this uh, permanent relocation fee. So again, this is the amount that a tenant would be entitled to receive if the landlord had a no-fault reason to evict the tenant under the rent control law or other just cause law. Um, so, in, in a lot of cases, especially the, the, the tenants who are facing large rent increases in excess of the amount that's um, authorized by TPA, many of those tenants might actually be protected by our local just cause law, but they might not be protected by any limits on rent increase. Um, so they're being sort of constructively evicted or there's an option for them to be constructively evicted through these excessive rent increases because they don't have another basis to evict. Yeah. Can I ask you a quick question before you move on? Um, so I saw that in your initial slide, and then here it is yeah. so before we move forward. What occasion is there for there to be something that's in excess of what the law allows as a maximum ceiling of 10%? So like, when could they be charged more than 10% in a 12-month period? So that they would, the landlord would only be limited by 10% or CPI plus 5%. They'd only be limited by that if they're subject to the TPA. So there's many units in Santa Monica that are newer than 15 years or are single family homes. That So they're exempt from the rent increase limits of the TPA and they're exempt from our local rent control law. So there's no limit, especially when we're not in a disaster, there's also this 10% uh, rent increase limit during a period of a state of emergency, which we're not really in right now. So right now, if you're not under TPA or rent control, then there's no limit on how much the landlord can raise the rent. And the units that are under neither of the two of those are, for the most part, they're buildings that are newer than 15 years old or single family homes that are owned by, not owned by a corporation. Mr. Augusta, did 1482 include a late amendment that uh, allowed for the 15 years or newer? It was always part of it, the, the 15 year. I think that that one went slipped in in the fine print on me. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. And in Santa Monica, you know, uh, many of those units that would be exempt from the TPA's just cause provision because of that 15 year thing are covered by our local just cause. So sometimes in Santa Monica, we have a lot of people who have the strong local just cause protection, but they might not have any rent increase, a limit on the amounts the rents can be increased. Um, and so they would be protected by this. I'd also say there's a possibility you could have a tenant in even a rent controlled unit under this situation whose landlord was not passing on general adjustments for years. And if they decide they want to pass yes. on a 9% general adjustment, the tenant would have the option to select this, uh, make this election. So what kind of notification process would a tenant have? So like, for instance, at the Rent Control Board, one of the very first projects I worked on was an info sheet, um, basically saying that every landlord, just like a lead disclosure, must in this city give every new rent control tenant a sheet that was front and back Mm -hmm. that basically gave a highlight reel of a tenant's rights and responsibilities. 
Yeah. And it covered in a sentence or two and then gave a reference to where they could find out more, all of these sorts of things. How would you propose to educate tenants who come and go mm -hmm. every day, every year, every month um, in this city, a knowledge that this is an option? Like a buyout agreement, it's part of the law that says they have to be handed the city's sheet, for instance. Right. Is there a sheet? So that one of the changes actually that we would be adding, and it might be on one of the slides, I might not have even included it, but um, it it would actually require whenever a landlord is imposing a rent increase, giving a notice of a rent increase that would trigger one of these options for the tenant, that that be stated in the notice of the rent increase, that the tenant has this option. I'm raising your rent by 12% or even 8% if that's more than what the TPA allows at that moment. You have the option to stay and pay this rent increase or to accept permanent relocation. I'm bug you one more time. Yeah. <laughs> so in the case of buyout agreements or cash for keys, mm -hmm. what we what we find in practice is that even though we um, demand, we mandate that landlords give that sheet when they're making any initial buyout offer of any kind to advise the rent resident of their rights. If they don't, and the tenant is unaware of the program, yep. they're just gone, yep. and and there's no remedy after it's too late. Right. So the like for in in our case, the info sheet is designed to at least our attempt that both long-term tenants and all new tenancies got that sheet mailed to them once in a while. Um, is there something proactive instead of instead of counting on one actor to perform right. that we're more proactively um, notifying tenants somehow, at least signing? That's or posted in the that. building, or mailed occasionally, or something, something, something. I guess it could be added to that info sheet. Well, only rent controlled tenants get that sheet. Yeah. However, if we had a rent registry in this city, Which is that could be part of that program. Yeah. Okay. But in the interim, maybe there could be something more proactive. I mean, I also, just using this quick opportunity to say something I mentioned to Haka, which is there should be like a disclosure during escrow to landlords who are purchasing properties. I couldn't agree I with you. I understand why that isn't happening because then at least we can show that the landlord knew all about rent control when they purchased. And so many claim that they don't. So I'm just using that as an opportunity to tell you. Just can I just make a comment about that? We did work with the building department some years ago to put on the residential building report, which is part of the escrow papers, that a building um, is subject to rent control. So and here's where I you think can they find do it, more. but but it's a very small piece when somebody's got all these escrow papers and things. So something more proactive would be good. But we we realize that's an issue and. We would think people buying property in Santa Monica <laughs> would know that they're buying or maybe buying rent controlled property and we're open for anybody to come and talk to us about it. So, But we're not part of those private transactions, nor do we know when they're occurring. So it's hard to be a part of them unless it's required by title company, you know, by state law as part of a title process. And then when we are looking at cases, what whether we can file them because they're in bad faith, one of the things we look at is what did the landlord know? when they took that action, raising the rent, you know, inordinately or trying to evict without just cause or whatever it is, and to prove that they had knowledge before they did this, and that would be one way to do that. But isn't due diligence their responsibility? I mean, when you get pulled over and you say, officer, I, I don't live here, I, I didn't know this was a 30 mile an hour zone, they say, ignorance of the law is no excuse. I mean, isn't that the same case? It's true, but I think it shows. I think bad faith is a little bit of a. Is, I just feel like it'd be better to have higher burden. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry to derail the. It's all related, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's a. I, I that's a very helpful point about getting ahead of these things and in, you know not just relying on one side to make comply with the law and provide the information that's not in their interest to provide for the most part. So. Um, so this goes a little bit beyond what we were specifically asked to do, but um, is an attempt to address when tenants are being constructively evicted for things other than excessive rent increases. And again, a landlord may be trying to evade um, or just not having a just cause reason to evict a tenant, but a situation in which a tenant may truly want to elect to move out, but they should have some sort of compensation for that. So one situation would be if the tenant has been temporarily re relocated for at least six months. We know that landlords sometimes will drag out temporary re relocation with the goal of getting tenants to give up and move out. And if a tenant chooses to do that and makes that decision, we, we would want them to at least have some compensation so that they can move on to the next thing. Before you move on. <laughs> yes. 
There's no point in waiting five yeah. minutes and then coming yeah, back to this, to this one here. point. Yeah. Yeah. So I've noticed um, um, there was a council member who, during the discussion of, a, of another rent control issue um, incorrectly conflated LA's law with our law. And things, you know, we've long discussed with other city departments and other elected bodies what, when and why tenants should be temporary, temporarily relocated. And there was a huge case the city prosecuted regarding um, a property on 10th Street where one plan was presented to the building department of some renovations and it morphed through tiny changes to this other thing and it took two years and all these things. And, and it was all elective. It was all cosmetic. It was all, so we don't allow, um, optional tenant relocation for just cosmetic upgrades to the entire building, which would displace a tenant. What we've had problems with is getting a lot of other city departments to acknowledge that and agree to a standard well, at the building department or at the planning department. I, yeah. And so I want to make sure that that's not allowing that carte blanche. Yes. I mean, I, so there's sometimes there's issues with permits. Sometimes there's issues with a limited amount of oversight. And in, in an ideal world, a tenant's not facing the situation where they're out for more than for any, for an extended period of time like that. And this isn't also entitling a landlord to say, well, it's been six months. It's time for you to go. I get to pay you the money and now you get to go. I mean, the tenant has the right to stay if they want, if they want to choose to do that. Um, but I think we've seen situations where the tenant is just they cannot tolerate it any longer. Um, and so, and it's also a deterrent effect for the landlord to keep this going because if it goes after six months, the tenant also has the right to demand the relocation payment at that point. I think we would recommend to you though also as something to add to that discussion is another discussion we've all tried tried to have for many years. And, and now that there's a new person in charge of code enforcement and maybe some hope of restoration of city budgets and positions in those departments is that, um, That, that code enforcement and the um, means and methods plan, sorry, that's what I was looking for, the means and methods plan be more carefully considered and more enforced. Um, we used to have a, a position in this city that was supposed to be a lookout and a coordinator between those, those things on behalf of tenants, and it really, that position landed in the building department. Mm -hmm. instead of like over here or it, instead of in code enforcement, it, yep. it it probably landed in the wrong spot in retrospect. Yep. And so just as you're, as you're considering yep. those actions, I, was, I would keep that in mind. We, so we have been having some of those conversations as well as this issue you're talking about. Discretionary repairs are not, when a landlord gets a permit to do discretionary renovations, not repairs, to things that are not necessarily required to be very clear to make sure tenants are very well aware that they are not obligated to provide access to their unit unless that's something they want to consent to. But just because a landlord gets a permit, that's not an authorization. Right, because they could offer a buyout offer 10 times, it's it's declined, and they're like, oh, I think I'll make some repairs now. And those take six months. And then it's like, now would you like that relocation? You know, we just want to try, try to anticipate. Mm -hmm. So I would also add that, you know, this six month thing, it's, if the landlord's paying the relocate, temporary relocation, you know, I mean, they would, they want to get the work done faster. But what we're seeing is there are situations, and we have a case pending now, where the landlord just doesn't pay the temporary reload and has to go through this whole you know, administrative process and, and then just doesn't pay it. I and mean, we have a case where the landlord did it, and the tenant eventually had to go somewhere else. And so at that point, that tenant could just say, okay, I want this flat amount of money because I can't keep staying on couches and sleeping, you know, on the street. And so okay. in this case, it was true that the guy didn't have anywhere to live. And they refused, landlord literally refused to pay the, the temporary relay. Probably refused to pay, pay the permanent as well, though. So, okay. But there would at least be a requirement. Um, so the last, the, the last three issues here kind of, again, get to constructive evictions where if the, if code enforcement were to actually make a finding, make a determination that, a tenant left as a result of tenant harassment because code enforcement can cite for tenant harassment. That could also, they could also order the, the landlord pay permanent relocation for that. Um, 
Similarly, there, there's a little bit of a gap right now in the permanent relocation ordinance where tenants are sometimes faced or in these units that cannot be made habitable. There might be a, a, a physical constraint limitation on the size of the unit. There's just like nothing that can be done to make it habitable, but there's nothing actually in the code that empowers the, our, the city to order the landlord to pay permanent relocation. Um, and sometimes it's, it's not clear how that's necessarily working in practice. So this is sort of maybe to just kind of bring this up to what's going on. Um, and the last, the last version is, is sort of similar. We want to encourage wherever there's an option to make a unit that's maybe not permanent or not, it's just a sort of ministerial thing, you have to file plans, we would prefer that landlords do that so the tenant can remain housed. Um, but if the landlord's sort of refusing to do that and the tenant chooses that they don't want to wait around for that to happen and they want to elect to get permanent relocation, this would give them the option to do that. And, and again, provide a deterrent from the landlord doing that because it's not it's not with no financial cost to the landlord. Fantastic. Um, and these are just some smaller uh, some smaller changes to the relocation ordinance related to when the fees are due. As I mentioned, then that the notice of any rent increase that's triggering this right actually has to tell the tenant about it. But very much take your point about needing some more education about that. Um, and then currently it's not actually stated in our ordinance that the city council establishes the relocation amount. So this is just putting it in our ordinance, but again, that's already happening. Um, I'll try to go through this part quickly. Um, the, we also, there was an instruction to make some changes to the buyout ordinance. Um, and so in the process of doing that, currently the buyout ordinance sort of lives in our tenant harassment ordinance, but it doesn't necessarily have to do that. So this, uh, one of the proposals is just to create its own chapter or um, that also to expand the buyout ordinance to not just rent controlled units, but all units that are subject to any local just cause. Because again, now we're a lot of tenants that have local just cause also have the TPA rent increase protection. So they have a full scheme of rent control. Um, so the one of the specific asks was to, to require that any uh, buyout agreement that is for less than the amount that the tenant is entitled to receive as permanent relocation is, an, is voidable by the tenant. They have the right to basically rescind or um, cancel out any buyout agreement they make uh, for less than the amount that they'd be entitled to as permanent relocation. The tenant also has the right to explicitly waive that if they choose to. Um, the law already requires that buyout agreements be filed with the city and the under this new ordinance, it, if the landlord fails to file out a buyout agreement with the city and then tries to evict a tenant for not complying with the buyout agreement, that would be a defense the tenant could raise was that the buyout wasn't filed with the city. So it's trying to get more compliance with that. Um, this is one other kind of new thing. Um, one form of tenant harassment that we see a lot is landlords pestering people with uh, buyout offers and that it's really hard to effectively tell a landlord that I don't want to be entertained with, or I don't want to entertain a buyout offer. So this would just make that explicit that if a tenant says, I don't want a buyout offer, I don't want to talk about it, that the landlord, the landlord comes back and re-offers that again within six months, that could be tenant harassment. Love it. And then our last piece. So, when I was at LAFL, I wasn't really allowed to suggest legislation unless I got an invitation. This was my <laughs> invitation, so I'm very happy about this. So, okay, so um, housing status is a protected class. All right, so currently we have um, in our anti-discrimination code, disability, age, source of income, parenthood, pregnancy, or potential or actual occupancy of a minor child. Um, one of the reasons we have these limited things is because of preemption by FIHA. So we can only have certain things. One thing that is not covered by, um, uh, by, by our law is uh, housing status. It's not covered by FIHA either. Um, and um, housing status is critical to add as a protected class because people who are unhoused or were formerly unhoused or don't have rental history or don't have um, you know, live in transitional or temporary or shelters, they don't have the track record that landlords require. So recently I had a client, a, not a client, a complainant, got to get put that hat on, <laughs> just <laughs> trying to work on that, um, a complainant who, um, you know, who, um, you know, sh I had somebody who did not have, you know, the history of housing and, they said, 
sorry, you, you know, we ended up turning it around. Actually, it was when I was at LAFLA, this particular case. But anyway, um, you have to, oh, they say you have to have three years of rental history. All right, that's really hard for someone who's coming off the street and trying to establish their lives, who gets a Section 8 voucher, which is like gold, right? But it's like, it's like not real gold. <laughs> it's like, what is that called? Fool's gold. Fool's gold. Yeah. It's fool's gold if you can't use it, right? And so the idea is because we have, you know, I don't need to go into the statistics on, on homelessness. Can we go to the next slide, please? But we do have good statistics and, you know, good information about, about the problem. It's one of the main priorities of the council. Um, and so, um, there's also really, really good evidence and literature about, um, how people who are unhoused or have a history of being unhoused have this barrier have barriers, but it's not the only barrier. There are other barriers, like your credit score and your criminal background and eviction record. But this barrier, just because of your status of having not been housed, you can't get housing, which is a huge irony. So um, we added source of income in 2015, and we've been really good at getting landlords to turn around and accept vouchers. I mean, I think I just had a success the other day. But it's, it's a lot of work. We have the problem that it's the whack-a-mole game. So the landlord says, oh, I'm not really saying I won't take your voucher. I I need a rental history. I need a certain credit score of 700. I need you to have, you know, an employment history. You know, and employment history would violate the source of income law. But there's some of them that are, like, not so clearly in violation. But if we add housing status, it would really help people get off the street and people who have, you know, been precariously housed will get into housing more easily. Um, and um, there's some good, you'll, there's some references at the bottom of the slide to the extent that you'll get the slide. You can see, um, you can see what the reports say. So um, in uh, 2022, Washington, D.C. was the first um, jurisdiction to amend its, its equivalent of our anti-discrimination law. Um, to ban discrimination against homeless people, including by landlords. They also did it in employment and in other areas. Um, AB 920, which was I'm sure that Brian's going to talk about, was signed by the governor um, and effective January 1, 2024. 11135 of the government code is adding housing status, and that means governments can't discriminate against people who are unhoused. But FIHA does not yet, yet cover housing status and in employment either. Um, and that might be part of a homeless bill of rights if one should ever pass in that sense. But right now, we don't have housing status. As far as I know, and I did a search, I don't think anybody else in California has a law that adds housing status to, you know, has add, they have not added housing status. We might be the first, um, and I think it would really be really good for Santa Monica to do that. So any questions? Or other feedback as well. All right, we do have a couple of questions in the queue for you, uh, starting with Commissioner Ivanov. First of all, thank you, well, thank Commissioner you. Yes, Ivanov. Yes, thank you. Um, outside of D.C., was there any other jurisdiction um, nationwide that you saw add um, housing status as a protected class? I read something that South Bend, Indiana might, <laughs> but I literally could not. I, I found a lot of, like, um, literature that's cited in there where they're recommending this as a strategy to deal with homelessness. Um, you know, experts are, are saying this. Um, uh, but I haven't, I think it's a pretty like cutting edge thing. So I don't know for a fact. And we do have um, PRAC uh, is an organization that you could look up PRAAC and you will see like all the places that have source of income discrimination laws in this in the country. But I don't, I think housing status is, and homelessness status is kind of a newer thing. Um, maybe they have it in some of the homeless bill of rights, but I don't know how much of it is extended to private landlords. Um, and that is a problem. Great. Thanks. Vice Chair Leslie. I can't think of a more better time that we need something like this with so many people experiencing homelessness right now. Um, 
with the number of evictions that are taking place, it's going to be really hard for the people that have been evicted to regain housing to get their feet back on solid ground. I, I really thank you for putting this, you know, together. I know this took a lot of work. Yeah. Those are just that's in my comments. Thank you, thank you. Commissioner Gwynn. Yeah, I don't have a comment. Just a qu uh, question. Just a comment about thank you again, especially the turnaround. And this was very quick, to be honest. But I also want to um, indicate that this tonight was a very great indication of having not just an advocate on the city council, but having a very strong um, advocate on the city council that's willing to realize how valuable rent control is to this city and bringing these type of things to us as well. So thank you to you. And of course, thank you to our advocates on the rent or on the uh, city council, but in particular one. <laughs> Her name is Carolyn Tarosis, <laughs> um, with a lot of help from some of her colleagues, and so that's great. Um, what I thought you were going to say is what a great partner we have in not only our, our current um, city council, but, but, but with the revamping of our city attorney's office due to retirements, we have some fresh blood. We have some uh, some fresh feet in the race. And um, what I hope you will take away from our inter our brief interaction tonight, um, whether we have a long history or whether we're brand new friends, uh, is that I think um, we've always wished that this agency could have an active relationship and an active partnership, especially when it comes to issues of tenant protections, tenant harassment, um, and interaction and recommendations to the city council that they be as clear as possible, that they be in consultation with this body and this agency um, whom we like to think of ourselves as experts in this subject um, matter area. So we really do appreciate um, the opportunity to partner maybe at an even deeper level that, and we already had a wonderful relationship, but even more. Um, and so we invite you to come back early and often, um, either on the dais like this with us or with our staff, you know, at all times when it's appropriate. You know, we have a treasurer in Allison and Haka and Rebecca Sherman have tried many cases, um, you know, worked. We, our information department headed by Daniel Costello is second to none. And that is the front line uh, of who the tenants usually find first before they come to you looking for help with tenant harassment. The, the complaint in the past was always calling uh, a tenant hotline or calling the rent control board and saying, well, the, the city attorney says, I don't have a case. It's not enough. It's not good enough. It doesn't meet some burden. I, how can it not? And they're, they're very, then they come to us asking for help, and then they start looking at decreased petitions and all these other things that maybe they can do when sometimes a really firmly worded letter from the city attorney's office can go a really long way to aiding in that partnership. So just wanted to leave you with that and say thank you for a robust and uh, very enjoyable and educational um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any other thoughts, uh, please any other Oh, thoughts? they will. Yes. We Let will. Let us know. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Without further ado, item 12B, Brian Augusta, who is very patient, and your ears should have perked up because we mentioned the word legislation several times, Denise in particular, um, Denise, meet our advocate at the Rent Control Board for uh, tenant no, issues. <laughs> All right, great. Brian, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, Brian Augusta, your legislative advocate in Sacramento, always a pleasure to be here. And Madam Chair, I appreciate you asking earlier whether I was taking a flight and needed to go first, but I'm always here along for the ride, and it's always a privilege to see the thoughtful way in which you all carry out your work. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go, go last and back clean up. And I will try to keep it short because it has been a long hearing so far, but we'll leave plenty of time for questions or comments that you all may have. Um, I'm here today to give sort of the year, end of year report. Um, I was last before you in August. We were in that time period just before the last sort of set of actions happened on bills in the legislature um, before they sent them, those that were going to continue to move 
um, down to the governor. And so I want to update you on what has happened since then, sort of final actions, um, but also put it in some context. You know, this, this year, as I may have mentioned in my last appearance, unlike several years uh, prior, we have had a much different budget picture in Sacramento. Um, with We went from record um, surplus to significant deficits, and that really kind of changed the picture of policymaking in Sacramento. Much of the conversation in Sacramento was not where can we make new investments in housing um, and to address um, housing security and homelessness but and many other issues, and more to what are some of the policy solutions that don't cost the state significant money. And so that was, you know, a lot of the conversation in Sacramento. In fact, I note in our report that there were a, a thousand plus bills that went down to the governor's office and he, he vetoed a significant number, but not unusual number. But, but a number of those that he vetoed had the same message, which is this, this bill, uh, is being vetoed in part because it has significant state costs that weren't addressed in the budget. Um, and so, you know, we saw that in, in a few different places in the housing and tenant field, including a bill that would have required more um, collection of data on eviction data statewide and outcomes in court. And so that that is a message that is going to carry over to next session, where we are, so far, the numbers demonstrate that the earlier projections about what October tax revenue would mean for the state were overly rosy. We have not yet received as much money as projected, so we may be looking at a greater deficit than was presumed before. So it's we're really moving into an area where the policymaking is really focused on a very you know limited set of things that that may cost money. And one of the ways that's going to affect <clears throat> the housing picture is that. In addition to providing tenant protections for and security for existing tenants um, and protecting our housing supply, we also need to be creating new affordable housing, right? And the programs that do so are slowly running out or have run out of money. And so we don't have a meaningful permanent ongoing source of funding to supply new revenue to those programs. And so what we do periodically is go to the voters with a bond um, to refill those coffers. And so there is a bond proposal, as is noted in the report, that would put $10 million in new funding to affordable housing, which will be on the November ballot if it passes. And that bond conversation, along with two other bonds, one about um, schools and one about climate, are going to be part of sort of a conversation next year about how much money can the state put in front of the voters to bond against and what can we afford. But um, I think a lot of folks who are watching the picture there are hopeful that there will be new funding in a bond in front of the voters in November. But outside of that, um, as I noted, we're, we're really in the sort of the picture of what can we do in Sacramento that, that is, does not cost money. And so although we started the year with um, a record number of new bills introduced, a significant number of new bills introduced, um, Going back decades, we had not seen previously that many. Very few actually made it all the way through to the governor's desk, and there's a lot of pitfalls along the way. But I want to, um, we run through a dozen or so of those in this report. Most of the others became two year bills, meaning that they may take action on them next year, um, or they died along the way. Most in, in typical fashion, many of them die in the Appropriations Committee when they hit the suspense file and don't move on. So, um, but of the bills that we've listed, I just want to call attention, I think, to three. Happy to talk about any others that may be on your minds. Um, the most significant bill, in, in my view, um, from the board standpoint, is uh, SB 567, which we've talked already today about the Tenant Protection Act. Um, 567 made a number of important changes to the Tenant Protection Act, most notably trying to deal with some of the um, loopholes in the just cause, the no-fault just cause provisions. And although it didn't ultimately make any changes to the withdrawal provision of um, 1482, so that remains sort of untouched without a lot of parameters around what it means to withdraw a unit, 
under the TPA. It did change the provisions with respect to owner move-in by establishing new standards about who can move in, um, when, how long, or when they must move in by, and how long they must live there to constitute owner move-in, and some remedies to tenants if they don't do so. Mr. Augusta, yes. that does not supplant our correct. law locally, though, correct? That's right. This is a different set of units, different law does not print your re regulation on that on your regulated units. Just clarifying. Um, and similarly, with respect to what's referred to as um, substantial remodel, um, creating some parameters, because we have seen a lot of substantial remodel cases where landlords are just asserting that they intend to remodel. Um, and it's unclear if any repairs are ever carried out, but by then most of the tenants have moved out. So uh, the author made changes that ensure that um, there's some evidence that, the, that it's going to be carried out, including that a permit, if a permit is required, which in most cases it is, is attached. And then if the repairs are not carried out, that the tenant has the right to come back at the prior terms and the prior rent. I think most significantly, the bill also add some additional enforcement to the Tenant Protection Act, clarifying um, the, that local governments can enforce the act, and also establishing a private right of action with remedies that include damages for tenants if, the, if a landlord violates either the rent cap or the just cause provision. So, you know, not to bury the lead, but the governor signed that bill, um, thankfully, and some changes were negotiated at the last minute um, including some redefinition of what who is an owner entitled to use owner move in, um, and also a delayed implementation. So these changes don't take effect until April first, which is unusual. Um, but that was something that landlord groups asked for. <coughs> so um, that's the changes to five six seven. And to your prior question, Madam Chair, you had asked about fourteen eighty two. It did from the start have a new construction exemption, in it, but I think notable is that it's shorter, 15 years, and a rolling date. And that rolling date issue in Costa-Hawkins continues to be a feature of policy discussions in Sacramento. And there was a bill, as I've, we've talked about this year, that was changed that rolling new construction date, failed on the Senate floor. But I suspect we'll hear more about that issue in the, in the years to come. But I think notable that 1482 does have a new construction date that is rolling and that is shorter than Costa-Hawkins and um, construction of, of new housing continues um, in, in throughout the state. Um, so two other bills I just want to quickly note. Um, also, uh, you know, directly relevant to your work is AB 1620, which give, authorizes rent control jurisdictions, and I believe somebody on the dais might have helped to work on this bill, um, to modify cost Hawkins in a very narrow but important way to ensure that um, a tenant who is seeking reasonable accommodation for a, a disability can move to an accessible unit under very strict circumstances um, without, in other words, to a first floor unit without, um, well, I should say, and maintain their current rent and um, lease terms, which otherwise would be a, a change of tenancy, which would allow the landlord to change those terms. Um, and that's AB 1620 by Zabur, which was signed by the governor. And then also um, modest but important change in sort of going to the lease up, a new tenancy. Um, one barrier that many tenants face is, um, in addition to other screening um, rules, is coming up with the three months of security deposit that is needed to lease up a new unit. Um, Assembly member Haney's AB 12 Current state law says it can be as high as three times the uh, monthly rent. Um, Mr. Haney's bill makes it one equal to one month's rent in all instances, except, <coughs> excuse me, if the landlord is essentially a small landlord, which is defined as one who doesn't own more than two residential properties with no more than four units. Um, some have pointed out that it's sometimes difficult to determine whether an owner who might own several properties in different names using a limited liability company 
whether those are all one owner. But that that is the one exception. And then the, like 567 has a delayed implementation. This has delayed implementation until January or July 1st of this year. But an important change that uh, um, many tenant advocates had long sought to lower that, that barrier for tenants. Um, so yeah, let me pause there or stop there and see if we have questions from the board. But um, I think those are some of the highlights of this year's session. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ivanov. Yeah, for uh, Carrillo's bill, AB 1317, mm -hmm. um, it says requires in certain counties. Um, if I recall correctly, we supported an amendment to um, exclude rent control jurisdictions from the bill, which I thought did not get approved. So what is that certain County's uh, language so referring to. as the bill was initially proposed, and we talked about this, I yeah. believe here, um, it may have had an impact on rent controlled units. Um, the amendment, because it was going to apply retroactively, so it would apply to existing units, the bill as, a, as signed by the governor only applies to new construction. So all of your regulated units would not be impacted by this. But there was not <clears throat> a um, there was not a provision that exempted certain jurisdictions based on having rent control, but it, but it now effectively excludes those units. But even now with, with new construction, why is it only certain counties? Which counties oh, are being excluded? Um, well, a majority, and I'm sorry I don't have the further list. I think it's about a half a dozen counties, and I think it was some of the larger urban counties, and it was probably a compromise to treat it like a pilot project and let it move forward. But L.A. County is one of them. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Seeing no other comment, did you have anything to wrap up or? Um, yes, oh, if Tracy. I may. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to say something about the renter's tax credit? Oh, yes. Oh, Thank you for that. You know, um, so there were two bills this year, and almost every year we see a proposal around the renter's tax credit, which is existing credit. Um, that tenants can claim on their income tax return, state income tax return, which is very small. And there have been proposals to both increase it and to make it refundable. Senator Glazier has one every year, which he introduced this year, but then amended it fairly early in the process. There was also a bill, AB 59, which would have raised it fairly significantly um, by Assemblymember Gallagher. That bill was held in the Appropriations Committee. And then sort of as an indication of what I was talking about earlier, the the numbers attached to that by the, I believe the Department of Finance, I think it was an estimate from the Department of Finance, were that it would, that increasing the tax credit in the way that that was proposed would have had an annual impact to the state budget of $4 billion B. So that's pretty significant. And so I think one question that comes up every year on that tax tax credit proposal is if that is really the cost to the state of that, how might we spend $4 billion? Is that where we would spend it or would we spend it in other ways? I don't know. But I think it also demonstrates the, you know, very cautious sort of atmosphere we're in in terms of budget impact. So. You know, Mr. Augusta, to that I would, I would reply to the state of California, how much does Prop 13 cost them every year? Yes. How much uh, do landlords get to pass through a huge chunk of their property tax bill every single month, every single year to the tenants of Santa Monica? Well, and, uh, yeah. and, and they reap all of the appreciation of the value of their properties while the tenants finance that for them for free and a very low tax rate. <coughs> so that, that would be my response to the, the state of, of the California. mortgage interest deduction, which of is, course. includes second homes, but... We're not here to talk about that. Well, we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> but if we were, that's what we would say. Um, so, Madam Chair, if I may, I just want to say that uh, tonight is probably the last time that I'll appear before you under the stewardship of Tracy Condon. <laughs> I know. I feel the same way. And there will be many other probably conversations, public and private, about this. But I do just want to uh, share my appreciation for both your friendship but also your trust and uh, faith in me and, and guidance. Um, we've been on this journey somewhat together. We were talking earlier tonight that she, that Ms. Condon came into this position in 2007, which is exactly when I started trying to be a lobbyist. 
Um, <laughs> and shortly thereafter, I had the privilege of coming to represent the board. And although the board members have changed, we've had Ms. Condon at the helm. And I am just so grateful, not only for um, our personal relationship and the, and the work we've been able to do together, but to watch how you have guided this agency through so many rough moments and help to guide it in a way that makes it both hue to the original um, intent of the voters, that rents be stabilized in the city of Santa Monica, and yet make the program work for both renters and landlords. And it's your leadership that has gotten this organization and this entity and your talented staff to the place that we are. So it's been a privilege to work with you. I'm going to be sad next time I come and see a different face sitting there. Um, nobody can match your, your amazing leadership and your success, but I do look forward as you continue on this journey that you're about to go on of hopefully taking some time off and earning some um, well-earned time to sit and contemplate that we, we spend some time together on that journey as well, because I'm hoping that although this is the last time I may appear before you, it will certainly not be the last time that we that we meet and share this work together. So thank you, Tracy, for everything. Oh, thank you so much, Brian. <clears throat> I've enjoyed working with you as well, and we've been on this journey, that's right. So I'm glad you were able to come tonight, and thank you so much for those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Augusta. Um, you know what? We're going to have a very anticlimactic but healthy ending to this meeting with the final budget report for the fiscal year of 22-23. Hey staff, let's keep it thorough but short and, and it's just going to be <laughs> enjoy short. enjoy this report. <clears throat> it's very short because there are all the details in the written report that I provided. And this is just an information item. There's no action required by the board tonight. So last year the board adopted an operating expense budget of five million eight hundred and seven thousand dollars. Uh, there were no additional appropriations or modifications to the budget during the year. With projected revenue last year of approximately $6,108,000, the budget projected savings of approximately $300,000. <clears> because the budget is an educated prediction of projected revenue and expenditures, there are often variations in both um, revenue collected and expenditures that occur, although, as we all know, Ms. Noseworthy for years has been very accurate in both of these projections. Overall, for fiscal year 22-23, revenue collected was just approximately $4,000 more than was originally projected, and expenditures increased by approximately $113,000. And the details for those increases in expenditures are within the written report. This resulted in the board having year-end savings of approximately, or just under $200,000 to be added to the board's reserves. Um, and that provides a total reserve fund balance of approximately $1.7 million. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, if there's anything in the report that wasn't clear, or if you'd like to ask about any of the information that was there. Otherwise, that ends my report. Thank you. And yes, Commissioner Gonska does have a question. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, one, under the registration fee section of the report, mm -hmm. uh, it stated that the... Um, that $35,000 were collected from previous years, and the figure includes $10,836 from past uh, in past due fees for two properties in particular that have been delinquent for many years. So my question is, uh, my understanding is that the regulations do not allow uh, landlords who are delinquent on registration fees to implement GAs. Is that correct? That's correct. They're so, not in compliance with the law. So were those properties in particular that paid past due fees this in this last fiscal year, was are we sure that, do we know that they did not inc uh, implement GAs? I don't know that we do know that. Do you know which two properties those are, Haka? Or did we proactively <laughs> contact those residents that and advise them of their rights under this violation of our law yeah, because there's something that we've talked about before and it's always right. something it's like how do we actually make sure that those regulations are followed because there isn't a mechanism to automatically flag those things so this might be an opportunity I mean it's a very limited only two properties or right. a small number but well, 
This year we are, as we talked about when the board adopted this year's budget, we are going to make a very concerted effort to go after those properties where the registration fees have not been paid. So the legal department will be devoting time and energy to that. And we will talk about, you know, that is a very good suggestion that we communicate with the tenants about it's possible that they have paid excess rent if rents have been increased while the owner was not in compliance with the law. So we'll... We'll talk about that and we'll work that into the program as we move into really collecting these registration fees. I love that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Great. Do you yeah. do you think that is there an opportunity to to look back at these properties in particular? Yeah. Uh, obviously you that. can't do it for all of past history, but it, maybe in the last fiscal right. year to we look can. at those in particular and see if that was we an issue or no. okay. And then similarly the um they're also not allowed to pass through fifty percent of the registration fees. Right. So is it, can we also look at to make sure that, that didn't occur? We can do that uh, for, these, for those properties. And we can do that going forward. What about their property taxes? The surcharges, they are not prohibited from passing through the surcharges. Okay. Okay. And then um, on refunded registration fees section, uh, I was curious if when refunds are issued to uh, landlords for registration fees that, that they paid but ultimately don't owe for various reasons, are refunds then passed? If the, if the tenant was charged 50% of those registration fees, is there a mechanism for the appropriate amount to be refunded to the tenant as well? Yeah. We usually refund prospectively. So from the time a completed um, fee waiver application is submitted, we will refund the remainder, remainder of the year. So if the owner, um, so they will not then be collecting from the tenant who now has that fee waiver. And if they had collected, um, if, you know, we don't get the notice out for a month or something in processing it, if they've collected any of that registration fee from the tenant that they're not entitled to from the completed application, we advise them they have to refund that to the tenant and we send a copy of the letter to the tenant. Okay, excellent. Uh, and then my last question is um, just sort of more broadly, Looking at when you when you look at the actuals from the previous uh, fiscal year, obviously as you mentioned, there are all kinds of reasons. It's, it's only an educated guess that, that the actuals are different than the projections. So, is there anything about these actuals that um, would uh, lead you to um, approach the current fiscal year we're in that budget any differently? Yeah, there were a couple of things that happened last year that. Um, advised what we did this year with the budget. So uh, those were related um, primarily to this, uh, where's the additional retirement contribution? Um, the additional PERS pay down. You see that was $82,000. That's a, there was a benefit that employees paid into that would have enhanced their retirement. The city, in looking to reduce future retirement costs, negotiated an agreement where uh, employees would no longer be eligible for that enhancement for retirement, but people had paid into it. People had contributed to it. So an agreement was negotiated that over six years, people would be reimbursed. Those people who are still working for the city would be reimbursed. At the time that that agreement was negotiated, we didn't know that that was going to come out of our budget. So this was a surprise to us when this year, when during this year, um, we had to chip into this, which now of course makes sense, but we hadn't realized that and finance had not advised us of that. So this was an unex unexpected expense that we have now planned for into the future. And it only applies to these long-term employees who are still, um, you know, still working for the city. So that type of thing, um, we, now that we know, we plan for that in this coming year's budget. There were a couple of things that happened unexpectedly last year. Um, I, we mentioned one employee who had thought he was going to retire at the end of the last fiscal year stayed into the next fiscal year, and so that resulted in some unexpected costs that came into this budget. Um, we try and predict that, but we never know exactly when somebody's going to retire. Um, so yeah, as these things happen, 
The overtime expenses were unique in that we hired a legal uh, secretary to help us with some litigation that we were working on. <clears throat> the passage of Measure RC resulted in some additional work that we needed to do for the database and communication materials. So things happen that are unexpected, but where we can, yes, we learn from things that happen and build them into the next year's budget. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Um, Commissioner Gwynn. Um, uh, it's interesting that <clears throat> Commissioner Gonska, that I talked to Tracy yesterday, I asked her almost exact same questions <laughs> you just asked her. <laughs> um, but I did have a, one clarifying thing, and I agree about um, letting somehow letting tenants know that they shouldn't get this, the, the GA. That said, in the, the ensuing newsletters that we send out to the tenants, we'll have the maximum allowable rent in there, and that should indicate, and I assume that that would show on there. No, we don't. It doesn't? No, we do not automatically block these general adjustments in the database. Um, I think to do that, we've done that in the past when there was like an outstanding code violation for a long time and so the owner wasn't entitled to the general adjustments. We provided notice to the owner directly so that he would know he couldn't implement the general adjustment and then we blocked the general adjustments in the database system. But we don't do that for all of these. So the amount that goes out on the newsletter is the total maximum allowable rent without general adjustments blocked. Maybe that would be something we could write into the newsletter, some explanation of that or add something to that. Okay. I'm, I'm going to expand yeah. on that. Two questions. So one about something you said and one about something you just said. So if, if a tenant besides these two buildings, which were grotesquely in arrears, you know, like very outstanding in arrears, um, if a tenant, what, what is the statute of limitations on when a tenant finds out that at a time during their tenancy, their landlord was out of compliance and shouldn't have been taking those GAs every year, for how long into the future can they go back? Three years. Just three years. So if okay. the owner is now collecting excess rent and has collected excess rent for the previous two years, they could apply for an excess, they could file an excess rent petition for those three years. Okay. And to Commissioner Gwynn's point, if our database tells us, because we send bills out, right? We send bills uh, for registration fees. When, when the bill goes out, but the account, you know, there's accounts payable and accounts receivable. And so when, when we bill for 1000 and only get 700 don't we know yeah. who didn't pay? We do. And in so fact, couldn't we be notifying after a certain prescriptive period, whatever makes sense, like, oh, well, they would have six months to pay it or a year, you know, but after a certain period, couldn't we proactively notify the tenants in those buildings that there's a possible violation? Uh, I want to, I checked yesterday. I mean, you've heard me give reports on the payment of each year's registration fees, mm -hmm. and we have very, very high compliance we of the payment of registration fees. What's outstanding now are people who haven't paid for several years. So there, so I think there are probably less than a hundred properties that we're talking about or, um, and some of them, many of those are Torca condominiums where the tenant may be entitled to a registration fee waiver, or the owner may be entitled to a registration fee waiver, but they haven't applied for it. And every year after we send the bills, you know, we send three sub, sub, Subsequent bills with the um, penalties added, and then in October we write the owners a letter and say, if you don't pay this now, we're referring it to the legal department for collection. And for the owners of Torca units, we send them the fee waiver application, and we say, you may be eligible for a waiver of these fees. Please submit this application. This year we've gotten more of those. Um, so that's something that we're working on too, but of the 100 properties, maybe half of them are Torca units or some number. So maybe the ones that are regular rent-controlled housing stock that have tenants in them, maybe that could be the first focus yeah. of, of a small right. project that we could take on. And then once those 50 are eliminated and have been advised of their rights, then on a going forward basis, when every year we get past a certain time limit after they're out of compliance with their registration fees, we'd only have a handful of, of buildings to notify with a right. general letter. Right. 
maybe that's something we could look into. All right. Well, seeing nothing else left on the agenda, um, thank all of our, our guests and our presenters that came tonight, and uh, thank you to staff and to uh, our colleagues on the dais, and uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. So can I just ask everybody, our next closed session is set for December 1st.